Good day or evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharif Debdoub. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Iowa uh, in the United States, uh, and I'm in the uh, Division of Biostatistics and Computational Biology, as well as the Department of Periodontics. Uh, my uh, main area of research is uh, the human-related microbiome, um, particularly that of the oral microbiome uh, and diseases related to it like periodontal or gum disease, uh, diseases associated with dental implants, um, and uh, causes of those diseases. So I, I've done work on tobacco, e-cigarettes, uh, diabetes, um, those sorts of things. So uh, today is the uh, second lecture of the uh, Center of Microbiome Science uh, webinar on microbiome informatics. Um, and uh, today we are going over high performance computing for bioinformatics. Uh, just a note before I continue, we are having a little bit of a technical difficulty uh, in sharing, uh, sorry, in video. Um, I'm currently unable to um, share my video, so apologies for that. I just saw a comment. Um, oh, okay, I see we're seeing the presenter view of the presentation. Thank you. I will switch that over. Okay, share screen. Uh, there we go. Okay. Thank you very much for pointing that out. All right. Okay, good. So, uh, a few little uh, quirks to begin with, but uh, hopefully the rest of it will be smooth. All right, so let me, there we go. Okay, um, so this is just, uh, again, an overview of the entire uh, course schedule for this uh, webinar series. Um, we're here at uh, week two. Um, I will also be presenting uh, the ecological statistics uh, portion uh, for next week. Uh, last year, we also went over um, using Chime and Mother, uh, uh, we decided to focus this year uh, solely on the statistics part of it, but those lectures are still available uh, on the Center of Microbiome Science website uh, if you want to go look at those. Uh, okay, and I am informed that I should now be able to share my screen, or sorry, to share my video. Okay, there we go. All right, so. You can all see me in my lovely office with my poster of the coffee plants behind me. Okay, good. So we will continue now. And um, uh, we will um, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, ask questions in the chat uh, during the, the presentation. Um, we are on a little bit of a tight schedule. Um, uh, in other words, I don't want to run over too much with my presentation, so um, we'll try to uh, keep most of the questions answered uh, toward the end. Um, but if something is uh, particularly urgent, I might answer it during. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, again, feel free to um, use the Q&A, um, uh, the, the Q&A uh, to uh, answer questions, and we'll, we'll try to get to them uh, at, the, at the very least by the end. Okay, so uh, again, so this is uh, high performance computing for bioinformatics. And so the first thing we need to talk about is um, the operating system, right? Sort of the, the base that all this is done in. Um, you may be familiar with um, Windows or Mac OS as an operating system, as sort of the software that uh, allows you to do things with your computer. Um, and uh, in uh, bioinformatics, it's the same concept, um, but instead of um, uh, Windows or, or Mac OS, um, we have uh, the Unix family, um, uh, the Unix family of operating systems. Um, so it was originally developed in the, the 70s, it's late 60s, 70s, um, at Bell Labs, um, and but today, the, the term uh, Unix with um, lowercase nix, the original is upper, all uppercase, um, but the, uh, you'll see 
capital U NIX or star NIX is, is pretty common to refer to a family of operating systems uh, built on a generally standard set of principles um, that are based around modular program design. Uh, so this includes um, uh, Linux, uh, Android is based on it, uh, Mac OS actually uh, underneath is based on a version of Unix um, and several other variants that you will see. This is just from uh, Wikipedia, uh, the Unix family tree. Um, a lot of these are historical, um, but typically uh, in a um, single user environment, so if you, if you buy a laptop with Unix installed, it will probably be something like Ubuntu. Um, a lot of the uh, um, computing centers that run uh, either supercomputing clusters or that sort of thing will run something typically like Red Hat, uh, mainly because they offer uh, enterprise support, that sort of thing. Um, it just gives you a general overview. Um, so uh, one important thing to understand is what's called the Unix philosophy. Um, and so it, the, the idea is that everything is modular and composable. Uh, and preferably easily extensible. Um, so the, the philosophy has many different forms, but this is sort of the clearest one that I found. So write programs that do one thing and do it well. Um, so sort of simplicity, um, uh, you know, if a program has 18 different things, uh, it, it one is harder to learn, um, and then as complexity grows, uh, complexity of the program grows and becomes easier, uh, harder to handle. Um, write programs two, write programs that work together, and three, um, write programs to handle text streams because that's a universal interface. Um, and so you'll see often in um, Unix programs, you'll see, and, and we'll get to some of this, but um, you'll run one program and then the output of that program will immediately go as input to a second program and potentially a third program. Uh, and that's the sort of general design philosophy. So each program does something small, and so then you can group a bunch of programs together to do something more complex um, by, building, uh, by building the process or the workflow out of a bunch of smaller programs. Um, and to a degree, you'll see this also in uh, bioinformatics workflows. Um, you'll see uh, in the, the next, let's see, three, four, so in, um, uh, in three weeks, uh, when we get to uh, metagenomic workflows, um, you know, you'll typically start with uh, a program that um, uh, handles uh, uh, sequence quality, uh, and then you'll perha perhaps run a program after that that um, uh, removes sequences from a certain genome, and then perhaps after that you'll run a program that finds genes within the, the um, DNA that's left. So bioinformatics has, uh, because it's on Unix, it has similar ideas that do one thing and compose a bunch of programs together to create a workflow to produce a final result. Uh, so the, the vast majority of bioinformatics programs um, are written with uh, Unix or some form of Unix uh, in mind. Um, so that does include, fortunately, Mac OS, um, uh, and so you'll see a lot of bioinformatics developers uh, or people working in bioinformatics with um, uh, working on, on Mac OS just because, or for, for one reason, because um, a lot of bioinformatics programs can be uh, compiled or recompiled for to run under uh, Mac OS. Um, so unfortunately, that leaves out, tends to leave out Windows users. Now, I would want to say entirely, um, but there are occasionally programs that you just won't be able to run, um, or at least not very easily, without using something like a virtual machine if you are if you only have access to Windows. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, the Unix philosophy permeates the ecosystem. So, um, the the example I mentioned before, where programs do one targeted thing, and then we use a bunch of programs together to achieve a final result. So. Um, before we started diving into actually uh, learning about uh, how to use Unix, uh, a couple things to keep in mind that you should really know. So one is the command line environment. And part of this is building a mental model of the directory structure on your computer. Um, so in, in graphical systems, 
uh, graphical OSs like uh, Windows and Mac OS, uh, and even even Linux, Unix, Unix machines all have um, a graphical interface as well. But uh, for running bioinformatics programs, you'll typically be interacting with the command line environment. <coughs> uh, yes, yeah, someone mentions Windows Subsystem Linux. So um, that is a, a relatively somewhat recent addition to Windows. Um, I haven't dealt with it personally. I know some people have had some issues getting things working, but it is there and it is uh, does expand uh, uh, the access of Windows users to um, more programs, more Windows, more Linux and Unix programs than they would have before. Um, so uh, getting back to things to know, um, so uh, in graphical environments, graphical uh, operating system interfaces, uh, you typically have a window that shows you uh, the files on your computer, um, perhaps the, the folder structure. So you, have, you might have um, one folder and then underneath that you have a bunch of files and folders. So you can go into that folder and then there's more files and folders. And so you get this sort of tree-like structure. Um, in the command line interface, you don't have that graphical representation. Uh, and so it becomes useful to, um, when you're working through these things, you, know, you might be running a program that has three or four inputs. One of those input files is in the directory that you're in, but one of the other input files, like a database, for example, might be somewhere else entirely uh, uh, on the computer. Um, and again, we'll get to that, but uh, building a mental model, metal, mental model of how your files and folders are organized is useful. Um, uh, how to execute or run a program and how to provide input to it. Um, archives and compression. So uh, a, an archive is essentially a container for uh, one or more files and folders. Uh, you'll see this often um, uh, as uh, uh, zip files, for example, or um, tar files. Uh, and compressed files are simply that um, a, a program was run to throw away some of the information, some of the redundant information, um, so that the ultimate file size is much smaller, but that that redundant information can be rebuilt later uh, when you uncompress the folder, the file or folder. Uh, and some simple scripting is occasionally useful. Nothing um, major, but you know, running for loops, that sort of thing, to loop over a bunch of files or sample IDs or something uh, can often be useful. Okay, so getting to the command line environment, as I mentioned, is a text-based interface for acting for interacting with the operating system. Uh, you often see the abbreviation CLI. Um, and, and so the, the main question is, why does a text interface persist, right? We all have keyboards and mice now, um, even virtual reality systems, so why does a text interface persist? Uh, mainly because, one, it's simple, uh, it's extremely flexible. Um, you know, you can write, if you have a, a program that, um, you know, has several hundred parameters, um, you know, you can incorporate all those into a program, um, relatively simple, simply. Uh, composability, which we mentioned, uh, low bandwidth, so um, uh, you know you can run. Uh, <laughs> there are uh, terminal programs that you can run on your mobile phone, for example. You can, uh, uh, and I, I've, I occasionally do this. Um, you can uh, uh, SSH into uh, into a, a remote machine like a supercomputing center and check on something. Um, uh, I know with 5G now that's not quite as impressive, but uh, uh, it's still uh, still useful. Um, and so, what does it do? Uh, essentially, allows you to type in commands, um, and then the the shell program executes them. And we'll get to what that is. So, uh, this is typically what you'll see: um, the uh, uh, little bracket there, the arrow, indicates the command prompt. So the operating system is telling you that it's ready. Sometimes you'll see a little blinking cursor, um, but the operating system is telling you it's ready for input. Sometimes you'll see a little bit more complex uh, command line prompt. Here it's telling you that the operating system is running uh, bash version 4.2. Uh, sometimes in addition to that, before the final prompt, the arrow or the dollar sign there, you'll see some additional information about 
um, for example, what folder you're in, um, maybe the time. Uh, different operating systems um, uh, have different ways to, uh, to show that. Um, and so uh, Bash is the, the free and open source version of the born again shell, uh, which is originally a, a, a Unix um, program. So uh, here's just sort of uh, something fun uh, that uh, I have my computer set up to present me a bunch of information when I log on. Um, but this is just sort of uh, uh, the things you can do. And yes, color is a possibility. Um, OK. So uh, when I say a command, what is a command? So a command ultimately is just a program. Uh, it's just like you know if you double click on um, uh, Safari or Photoshop, um, those are all programs. Uh, this is just a text uh, command line interface version of a, a program. Um, and so uh, this is sort of the breakdown or the anatomy of a command. So you'll see that um, the, the command itself, and he here I've uh, labeled it as CMD. Uh, that's the name of the program. Uh, and we'll get to how the system knows where the programs are later. Um, but uh, yeah, so we start with the prompt, the dollar sign there. The program, the program name itself is the command. Um, and then following that, you'll see dash A and dash F. Uh, those are flags. Uh, and those differ from, uh, uh, or those are, uh, differ from other types of parameters. And you'll see I've got the bracket there covering everything after the command. So everything after the command are parameters. Um, but the dash A and dash F are special parameters that uh, don't have any input. So uh, if you specify one of them, it's just a true or false. So um, either turn some program option on or turn some program option off. Um, after the flags, you'll see dash T. Uh, and so dash T is um, a standard parameter that does take some sort of input. Um, so often you'll see dash T uh, meaning threads. So if a program uh, can, um, uh, most modern CPUs can run multiple things simultaneously. Um, and uh, those are called processes or threads. And so here we might, the program might be taking um, a parameter, a thread parameter of 12. Um, dash O is a pretty common um, uh, shortcut for a parameter for uh, output. Um, so in this case, it's an output file called out.txt. Uh, dash I similarly is very common as an input parameter. Um, and so here you'll see we've got, instead of a single uh, value for that parameter, for dash I, we have three. So dash I, so file, dot, file one dot text and file two dot text. And you'll see uh, also everything here is separated by spaces. Um, and so uh, because of that, uh, spaces in file names um, are uh, generally avoided in Unix. Uh, there are ways you can get around it with um, a, a backslash before the space uh, to sort of what's called escape it. Um, but in general, try to avoid spaces in, in file and directory names when you're dealing with a command line. Uh, and then finally, uh, you'll see that uh, all the previous parameters were what is called the short form parameter, so a dash and a single letter. Um, most command line parameters uh, will have two forms. They'll have the short form and then the long form, which you see at the very end there. Uh, the long form can be useful um, if you're trying to keep a record of what you've done and don't want to have not memorized all the command line parameters. Um, so dash i, for example, the long form might be dash dash input. And for output, it might be dash dash output, uh, those sorts of things. So um, uh, if you're per perhaps sharing uh, a program, uh, the, the command line um, run for a program with someone else that might not be as familiar, you might want to use long form um, to give them a better idea of what's happening. Or again, just for yourself. OK. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, OK. So, just a, a simple example. Oops, lost my headphone there. OK. 
Um, so the echo command uh, just basically uh, echoes what you type back at you at the command line. Um, the dash E I added uh, uh, just to interpret um, uh, uh, command characters. So you'll see the, the backslash N there uh, just to get it um, uh, on, on the next line. Um, and I, I uh, stole the stroke from Twitter. You can see the uh, uh, reference down at the bottom there. Um, but basically, again, so the you got the command prompt, the dollar sign echoes the command, dash E is a parameter, and this is actually a flag. Um, and uh, the string here is um, the input, is input to the program. Um, not all programs, in fact, most programs don't typically have a dash I. Um, uh, at least Unix programs, they just, uh, the, the uh, last uh, entry is, is often um, the input to the program. Um, and so just, uh, so you've got your command, your flag, and your uh, uh, input to the program, and then below it you'll see what happens as the output. Um, and so again, this is the breakdown, and uh, this is an excellent website, explainshell.com. So you can type in any command, and it will um, uh, perform. This is just a, literally a screenshot uh, from that website, uh, and it will break down the command for you. Um, uh, and and uh, especially if it's a if it's a standard Unix command like echo, um, it will actually uh, be able to look up the manual for that program and tell you what the flag or parameters mean. So in this case, dash e enable interpretation of backslash escapes. Uh, oh, and then it uh, tells you what the program does. Um, uh, yeah, display a line of text. So, okay. All right. Um, so, why is this all important to understand? And so, this is a quote from one of my favorite authors, Charlie Strauss. Um, I've been saying for years that most people relate to computers and information technology as if they're magic. And to get the machine to accomplish a task, they have to perform the specific ritual they've memorized with no understanding. Um, and so this is a problem because uh, most of the time you're going to run, or often enough, you will run into problems. Um, you, know, you type a command and it spits out some error at you. And if you're just going to sit there and freeze, well, then that's a problem. Um, so becoming familiar and understanding what the programs are, what their inputs and outputs, what they expect. Um, you know, you might have just, for example, uh, typed the the flag wrong, or um, typed the uh, uh, path to a directory wrong. Uh, and so, being able to uh, understand how these programs work, what their inputs and outputs um, and expectations are, uh, will be immensely helpful to you uh, if you want to do things on your own, <laughs> not have someone looking over your shoulder helping you. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, you really no need to know what programs do. Um, so, uh, you know, let's say you found this command on your favorite information website, superhackers.biz, um, and it tells you that this is going to solve some problem for you. Uh, one, it's not. What is going to happen is you're going to erase everything. <laughs> um, a lot of program, a lot of computers. Uh, you know, we'll have especially shared computers. will have protection against this. Um, sudo is uh, uh, a super user command, so you have to have administrative privileges. But essentially, rm deletes things. Dash r deletes them recursively, and dash f um, uh, forces uh, things to happen. So you won't be asked, "Do you really want to delete this?" It will just and slash refers to the root uh, of the computer. Um, so this command would basically delete all files. Um, the other thing I'll point out here is uh, sometimes you will see this where uh, flags, uh, because they take no parent, they take no um, uh, additional input, will be joined together. So you could also type rm-r space dash f, um, but since they're flags, you can you'll see them squished together like that sometimes. Okay. Um, and yeah, and so this is again the uh, explainshell.com breakdown of the command I just ran uh, and, and everything I just explained. Okay, so 
Uh, as I mentioned before, it's important to have a mental model of the directory and file system in your head, at least to some degree. Um, and uh, paths are how we refer to things, how we get around um, in a command line environment. They're, um, they tell you where to go, where things are. So an absolute path always starts at the top um, and always has a backslash as the very first character. Um, because an absolute path you know, starts from the root directory. As I mentioned, um, directories are often uh, visualized as trees. And so uh, you will see, um, referring to the root being the, the origin um, of all the directories. Um, a relative path uh, either starts with just the file or the directory at the beginning, or a relative reference. So here you'll see dot dot um, slash dot dot slash. And so this refers to, so the dot dot is a um, uh, reference to the directory immediately above you. Uh, and so two dot dot slashes then would refer to two directories back or up, depending on how you're looking at things. Um, and so here's another uh, relative reference. This, if you um, type this in, the system will look for that file uh, in the current directory that you're in. Um, so to, again, to visualize this, um, the root directory is a slash, and so all the, f all the system files and folders start there. Um, and so you'll see this is a typic typical um, layout of a Unix operating system or Linux operating system. Um, you'll see bin, which is a file, a folder that contains um, a lot of the executable, prog executable programs. Um, users, where um, all of the user directories are stored. And if you log into a shared system, again, like a, uh, a computing cluster at your university, for example, um, then when you log into that system, <coughs> you'll almost certainly be starting out in your user directory. Um, and so when you log in, uh, if you type, there's a, a command that tells you what directory you're in. Uh, so if you do that the first thing when you log into a system, uh, you might see something like this, slash users, uh, and then your username. Uh, temp, TMP is for temporary files, and um, the USR directory is typically for user installed programs, uh, programs that don't normally come with the operating system. Um, so uh, and again, this is just a, um, uh, a figure taken from um, that uh, O'Reilly published uh, book, Learning the Unix Operating System. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, input and output redirection. So uh, you'll see this sometimes uh, in, in programs. So there is standard input. Um, so for example, you might, um, if a program doesn't, for example, if a program expects, you'll see sometimes programs expect uh, text input, but your input is actually inside of a file. And so if you want to um, uh, give the contents of a file to a program, you'll use that um, uh, left angle bracket, uh, standard output. Um, as you've seen with the echo command I demonstrated, um, most Unix programs will when you run them, print some sort of output. Um, and if you don't want to see that output, but for example, you want to store the output of that file, um, store the output of that program in a log file, um, then you can use the uh, right angle bracket uh, to redirect the output from where it would normally print to the screen to a file. And we'll, we'll see examples of these. Um, if uh, you're going to run a program multiple times and you want to log the output to um, one single file, then you use two angle brackets to append instead of simply overwriting. Um, and standard error, that's not as important. I just put it up there for completeness. <coughs> um, and so for example, the cat program, um, which is short for concatenate, uh, its normal method of operation is um, it simply uh, concatenates the uh, input files you give it and prints them out to the screen. But if you want to, for example, and, and, and these are all, this is 
a practical example, um, if you want to combine two FASTA files, for example, uh, into a third file, um, then you could use this command. Uh, and so instead of just printing out the concatenation of the file list A and list B to the screen, it now writes those to a third file list C. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a useful variant. Um, you'll see that we haven't provided any input to the cat program. And so if it doesn't see any input files, it will revert to expecting input from standard input. Um, and so if you run this command cat angle bracket list.txt, you will um, hit enter. You'll see your cursor move down to the next line and do nothing. Uh, and so what it's expecting you to do is type things. You can type, uh, type whatever you want, hit enter, type another line, hit enter, type another line. And then when you're done, you tell the program you're done giving it input by typing the sequence control C. And then it will take what you've typed and output it to a file called list.txt. Um, and so again, this is very practical. This is a very quick and easy way to create a new file with some information in it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated example. Let's say you have a file called big list that has a list of information in it that you want sorted. And so these sort program, uh, you can um, input your file contents into the sort program by using the standard input redirection. Um, and then again, normally sort would print out to the screen the results of its calculations. Uh, but instead here, we are going to redirect that output from the screen to a file called slist. And so the sorted, um, the, uh, sorted output from big list will be created, put into a new file called slist. Uh, all right, yes. So um, uh, the angle brackets let you read to and write from files. Uh, but what if you want to, um, uh, as I've mentioned before, what if you want to uh, run some sort of calculation or computation um, on, a f on a file or something else and pass the results of that to another program to do some further computation? So now we have the pipe command. So um, uh, yes. So this is another command who. Uh, this just tells you who's logged in. Um, uh, and these are just I had I had multiple tabs open uh, to the same uh, to the same computer here, which is why you see three things there. Um, but let's say that you wanted to um, sort this output. Um, so you could do this. You could say who redirect the output of the who program to a file called users.txt. And then you could um, sort it by redirecting the input, uh, by um, inputting the user's text to the uh, text file to the sort program. Um, but that's too long, we don't have time. So instead, we will directly output the, um, uh, directly send the output from the who program into the sort program using the, the vertical pipe character. Um, and so on, uh, most uh, US-based keyboards, um, it will be on the left-hand side, or sorry, the right-hand side of your keyboard uh, above the enter, the return key. Um, uh, but it's almost always typically um, a, uh, on the, the backslash uh, character, uh, but the backslash key, so you typically have to type shift and then the backslash key to get the pipe. Um, uh, different, you know, I, I know we've got people from all over the place. Um, I know European keyboards have some differences. South American keyboards have some differences. Um, but uh, look for a, a long vertical up and down um, looking character somewhere on your keyboard. Uh, and that will probably be the pipe. <clears throat> and so what this does, actually let me go back real quick. So you'll see um, the uh, it was sorted here. Um, uh, in this in this manner, and then we've run the sort, and now um, uh, the uh, console user is at the bottom, and the other two users have been sorted at the top. Okay. So, um, a little more complicated example. Let's say we want to um, extract a certain field, uh, so we can use the cut command to um, split up the fields by spaces. Uh, and then select the third field. I uh, try the um, 
Yes. Um, there are multiple spaces there, so it's this isn't ideal, but gives you an idea. Um, uh, and so this allows us to uh, another little more complicated example um, of how to uh, uh, run a complex process using the composability uh, idea of the Unix philosophy. Okay, wild cards are extremely important, um, uh, and typically uh, you will reference a wild card by using the asterisk. Uh, and in Unix, the asterisk will match any number and kind of characters. Uh, it's usable with most Unix programs. Um, so you can say start at FASTA, and it will um, reference all the files that in the directory that you're in, your current directory, that end with .fasta, regardless of what comes before the .fasta. Um, and so when you use as a parameter to a program, then the, the operating system will go look for all those files and uh, transparently pass those a list of files to the program. Um, so it's sort of it's sort of a transparent calculation. So you give it you do, the the star.fasta doesn't actually go to the program before your operating system executes the program. It replaces the .fasta with a complete list um, of files. And someone is raising a hand. Um, uh, yeah, if you want to go ahead and and put your question in the Q and A, uh, we can get to that. All right. Back over here. Okay. Um, so another example: if you have a bunch of um, soil samples, um, you might want to grab soil samples one through a hundred instead of typing out soil one dot fasta soil two dot fasta. Um, you can do that. Okay. Um, and it can be used multiple times. So um, if you have a bunch of files that all start um, with R. Um, and somewhere in the middle have a dot fa dot and then end with anything, um, this will match all of those files. Um, and and uh, uh, someone just asked uh, about uh, the recording. Um, the recordings for all of these uh, will be uh, made available um, uh, within a few weeks, uh, typically after, but definitely by the end of the, uh, the webinar series, um, all of the uh, the webinars will be made available for um, uh, the, the recordings of these these webinars will be made available. So you don't need to worry about that. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, whereas the asterisk matches any character, um, the question mark matches a single character. So um, for example, if you have um, the, the example I mentioned before, if you have soil 1.fasta, soil 2.fa, soil 3.fa, um, then it will match those, but it will not match soil 123.fa. Okay. Uh, so before we go a little bit further, um, I kind of mentioned this a little bit with um, uh, spaces, um, and that um, spaces are sort of a special character that you should generally try to avoid. Um, but uh, uh, just in general, these are a few good uh, rules for naming things. Um, and uh, this is not my own. I borrowed this um, uh, from Jenny Bryant, I believe. Um, but you can see the, the link to her uh, excellent uh, presentation there, uh, project management and naming things. Um, uh, but uh, essentially, a name should be first of all machine readable. Um, you know, so uh, most Unix programs uh, aren't expecting emojis uh, in file names. Um, following machine readable, they should be uh, to some degree human readable. So keep um, uh, you know if you're looking at the file name, you should have a pretty good idea of what's inside of it. Uh, and also, you should name your files um, such that they play well with default ordering. Um, and so you'll often see this uh, if you have a list of numbered files. Um, again, going back to the soils, you might have um, 100 soil files, right? So you have soil 1, soil 2, and you get down to soil 10.fasta, soil um, 30.fasta. The default ordering 
um, is sort of string based. So you'll see soil 1.fasta, uh, and then you'll see soil 10, soil 11, soil 12, all the way down to soil 19, and then you'll see soil 2.fasta and soil 20. Uh, it's because um, uh, it's sort of going character by character and sorting them uh, in that order instead of by numeric order. Uh, and so to deal with that, you would uh, be better to, um, if you want them to display in numeric order, um, to number all of your files. You can pad it with zeros. You can say soil 001.fasta, soil 010, which would be 10, um, and then all the way out. And if you have three digit numbers, so you could say then um, soil 100.fasta, um, and then it will order it in the order you would expect. And so here I have a couple of um, examples of bad naming, um, some DNA, so one doesn't tell you what's there, uh, it could be anything, and two has a space in it. And again, figure two, figure what's there, it's got a space in it. Um, better namings would be um, uh, HNS would indicate the um, sample types, in this case, uh, this is from uh, one of my projects, so HNS stands for Healthy Non Smoker. Um, and sample 214 and uh, the forward read or the read one um, of a paired end read. Um, and the same with the figure. Uh, you have figure two and just give some description um, of what's actually in there. So that's it's, uh, when you're doing these, th when you're looking at these things uh, in a command line environment, um, you, know, you don't have a quick view, for example, um, you have an idea of what's in inside of files. Uh, and so, um, uh, just going back real quick, uh, so with the, the question mark, yes, just just as with the star, you can use multiple question marks um, within a single file name or folder or path um, uh, and to do the same thing that you did with the multiple stars. Okay. All right. So, and just a reminder, if we can try to keep all the questions in the Q&A, um, just so we can keep questions separate from, from comments, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so this is just a broad overview um, of Unix commands to know. Uh, feel free to print this out and stick it up next to your desk. Um, but I've uh, put these in a sort of pseudo order of importance, um, and uh, importance being how often you might use these. So, uh, and we'll, we'll get to all or most of these here um, uh, as we move along. Um, and again, you don't, don't feel the need to run out and memorize all these immediately, um, but uh, you know, you'll, as you get into this, as you get into to doing bioinformatics and working with these programs, you'll slowly start to, to know them by, you know, just by using them so often. Um, but uh, uh, like I said, this is just a general list of um, the, the top commands I would get to know. Okay, so the first command is ls. Um, which stands for list, uh, gives you a listing of your directory, the current directory that you're in. Um, and so you'll see I've given it the parameter dash L. Um, if you just do ls, it'll just give you a simple list of your files um, with no additional information. Uh, but here at dash L, it um, uh, lists them in, in vertical order. And it gives me a whole bunch of information about them. Um, and so starting from left to right, you will see the um, file, uh, file whether the, uh, the thing you're looking at is a file or a directory. Um, so the file type, sorry. Uh, and then you'll see a bunch of, uh, a, a set of three groups of um, three characters, so RWX. Um, and so these are file permissions. So who can do what to the files? So the owner, um, of this last file here can read and write it. Um, other people in the same group, um, in this case the group is staff, um, can only read it, um, they can't write to it, uh, and other people outside um, of the, the owner's group of users um, can also only read it. Now on directories you always see an X for everyone. Um, uh, if they can access that directory. Um, the execute permission is required if you want to actually go into a directory and see what's there. Um, now you can also have, you could have a directory um, that you can go into but you can't actually read or list the files um, depending on how permissions are set up. 
and we'll get to Unix permissions in a little bit here. Um, a lot of these aren't super important, like the number of links, I just put it there for completeness. Um, but this column lists who owns each of the files and directories. Uh, and by owner, I'm referring back to the set of permissions here. Um, the group, uh, the size in bytes, um, which isn't super helpful, and we'll get to that, um, uh, make that a little bit more helpful. Last time the file was modified, and then ultimately the file name. Um, and so if you uh, append a, an H flag to the, um, the LS there, then it will change from um, being just in bytes to uh, what's called the human readable size. Um, and so it will con anything in bytes, it will keep it in bytes, but give it a B there to indicate that it's bytes. Uh, megabytes, kilobytes, um, and you see, might say a G or a T for gigabytes or terabytes if you have files that large. <clears throat> All right, so uh, again, getting back to file permissions, um, this again is just a, uh, I realize I don't have a citation for it, but um, this is borrowed from uh, the Wikipedia page on Unix permissions, Unix file modes. Um, and so again, they're always in groups of, of three uh, with that first bit um, indicating whether it's a file or a folder. Um, and so uh, you'll also see that there's a symbolic notation and a numeric notation. Uh, when we get to the chmod or um, change mode program later, um, it's often easier. You can use both, but it can often be easier um, to use the numeric notation uh, depending on what you want to do. And again, this is just from Wikipedia, so you can um, go look this up. Okay. Um, now, you'll notice that uh, in addition to what I had before, dash LH, I've added an A. So I now have LS dash LAH. The A indicates that, it want, that you want to see all the files, including those that are hidden. Um, and by default, uh, hidden files are files that start with a dot. Uh, and so you can see now um, I attempted to hide a folder, a file called plans for world domination. Um, that isn't normally visible if you just use um, ls or ls-l. Uh, and you'll also see here um, the dot dot and dot um, entries. So those are present in every directory. They're automatically added as soon as you create a directory. Um, and again, they are uh, essentially shortcuts for um, the previous directory or the directory above you in the tree for dot dot and dot um, refers to the current directory. Um, for example, if you have a, a program that you wrote or downloaded that's just in your current directory and you want to run it, you will need to append dot slash in front of it to tell the operating system, look here for this program. By default, when uh, you try to run a program, uh, the operating system um, looks in a certain set of directories um, for that program, and if it can't find it, then it'll say program not found. Um, so sometimes you have to use a dot uh, slash to refer to something in your current directory. Uh, okay, the next command, uh, cd, which stands for change directory. And so again, you start out um, the uh, sort of a uh, reimagining of that uh, uh, book image that I showed you earlier with the directory tree. Um, and so for example, if you want to uh, go to the um, data folder under the user under Aria's user user folder, um, then you can give it a uh, you can go there no matter where you're at um, by using an absolute path. Uh, and often um, you'll you'll want you'll often switch back and forth between, um, absolute and relative paths um, based on which is simpler, right? Depending on where you are, it might be actually easier to use the absolute path instead of the relative path. You know, if you're deep into the directory tree, you might have to type six dot dot slashes to get back up to a place where you can then go to a different folder. Um, and so uh, you'll, you'll want to use both. And so here's an example of how you would get to that folder. Um, and so you'll see that running that command will then put you in that highlighted folder. Uh, now let's say that we're in the data folder and you wanted to get to um, the pbarbata uh, genome folder 
under uh, the other under the Daenerys user. Uh, bonus points for uh, figuring out what that species is. Um, and uh, you could use the same similar command that you used before, starting with slash users. Um, but if you wanted to use a relative uh, command, a relative path, um, then you would use dot dot would put you back up in the aria user uh, folder, and then one more dot dot would put you back in the users folder up here, and then um, and then you would descend back down the other side of that tree, and you would end up there. Okay. Um, Yes. So the next command is uh, pwd. Uh, it gives you um, the. Uh, uh, it stands for print working directory. So the working directory is just the directory that you're in at the time. And so let's say you're doing a bunch of stuff. You get coffee. You come back. Oh, where where was I? I completely forgot where I was. Uh, and the Unix the Unix command line by default is just the dollar sign. Remember. Um, and so you may not. Uh, know or remember where you are. And so PWD is always your friend. Um, if you're going to memorize one command besides LS, PWD is probably the next one. Uh, just to remind yourself where you are. And it always gives you the full um, absolute path to where you are. Okay. Um, now, the next thing we'll go over is making new directories. Uh, the command for that is mkdir. Uh, for uh, hopefully obvious reasons. And so let's say we want to create a new folder under ARIA called EDM. Uh, and uh, uh, again, we can do it with a, an absolute path. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So uh, we can do this with an absolute path. Um, and so, oh, sorry, yeah, in, under Daenerys, ARIA already has an EDM folder. So let's say Daenerys wants to also make an EDM folder under her user directory. And so we run this command, and now both of them have EDM folders. Um, they really like electronic dance music, apparently, in Winterfell. OK. Um, now, let's say you want to, um, uh, let's back up before we created the new EDM folder. And let's say that she wants to create uh, multiple folders uh, at once, or let's say she wants to create some sort of directory structure um, with with multiple folders that don't exist yet, and so the dash p parameter to mkdir will allow you to do that. Um, so you give it a path slash users slash Daenerys slash edm slash aedm. Uh, I don't know what that stands for. You can come up with something cool. Um, but uh, again, this is before we ran the previous MKDR uh, make directory program. Uh, and so EDM doesn't exist, and AEDM doesn't exist either. Uh, but giving make dir the dash p parameter will say, anything that doesn't exist, go ahead and create it. So running this command will then create the EDM folder, and then underneath that will create the AEDM folder. <coughs> All right. So. Um, Going back to uh, the directory structure we had before, let's say uh, we want to copy, um, uh, instead of creating, instead of Daenerys creating a new blank f uh, empty folder, let's say she wants to copy um, Arya's uh, EDM folder to her own user directory. Um, and so we have here, as you'll see, the, the cp command for copy. Uh, dash R is what you need to use if you're going to copy a folder. Uh, it stands for recursive. So it will copy that folder and everything under that folder, um, including files and other folders. Um, so it's a good idea before you use the dash R to uh, know how much data is actually in a folder and all the other folders that might be underneath it. Um, so you don't try to copy something too large. Um, and and uh, uh, also note that um, I, I mentioned this before, but if you don't use the dash r um, when you're copying a directory, uh, Unix will complain to you about it and say that you're trying to copy a directory. You, you can't do that without the dash r. Okay, so um, cp is the command. Dash r is the flag that tells it to uh, copy recursively, and then um, the next uh, parameter for cp is the source 
So again, this can be either file or folder. Um, and then the second parameter is the destination. So copy source destination. So we run this command. Uh, and, and we can also have um, the uh, uh, relative version of this. So as opposed to the, um, uh, the longer uh, absolute paths. So, and you can mix and match. Uh, here I've got, uh, in both cases I've got, um, or in the first case I have all absolute paths, in the second case I have all relative paths. You can mix and match. Um, so you could write cp-r slash user slash aria slash edm and then dot to tell it to copy to my current directory. The next command that's uh, very useful is move. Uh, yeah, so uh, question, can we copy multiple folders at a time? Uh, yes, so um, the, uh, the source uh, parameter can actually be multiple program, or multiple things. So you could type cp, um, if you have uh, folders one, two, or if you have files one, two, three, and four, you could say cp one space two space three space four, and then the final, um, uh, the, the program will know that the, uh, the last parameter um, is always the source. So there's, you can have multiple, or sorry, the, the destination. You can have multiple sources, but only a single destination. So it will automatically assume that if you have more than two parameters, then uh, the final parameter will always be the destination, and anything else will be sources. So it will copy all of those into the destination. All right. Uh, okay, so moving and renaming. Uh, both these can be accomplished with the MV command. So going back to my example directory I had here, um, if I want to rename, let's say I, I mistyped it, um, and RUG176 should have been named RUG177. And so this command would accomplish that. And again, just with just as with copy, you'll see this, um, uh, uh, not looking for, um, pattern uh, pretty commonly where a lot of Unix programs will have sort of a source destination sort of pattern. Uh, and so uh, similarly with move, you have the source, which is the, the original file, um, and then the destination is what you're renaming it to. Note that again, this is these are um, uh, relative paths. Um, the, uh, if you don't have a slash in front of a file or in front of a path, um, it's assumed to be um, relative, and so there's sort of an implied, uh, it's implied that reg176.fa is in the same directory that you're currently in. And also with the, the, the destination, reg177.fa um, uh, is in the current directory. So you'll end up, so this effectively renames it, um, although it's essentially, it's also technically moving it. Um, from the current directory to the current directory. Okay, and then you can see um, I've uh, updated the um, uh, the display, the command line display. So now it's reg one seven seven. Okay. Um, now let's say we want to put reg one seventy seven um, into a separate folder called uh, nothing to see here, and so we can move. Um, uh, we are moving it from reg177.fa in the current folder um, into uh, a new folder. Um, uh, and so this is, uh, even though it looks like the same pattern, um, and it essentially is, it's source destination, um, the, the operating system knows that nothing to see here is a folder. And so it's not going to rename reg177.fa to a new file called nothing to see here. Um, since it knows that it's a directory, it will simply move the file into that directory that you've given it. And again, you can also, um, same as with copy, you can move multiple files and folders um, into a new folder uh, by um, uh, having multiple parameters, multiple source parameters um, to, the move, uh, uh, to the move program. Now, the one thing that's different about move is that you don't need a dash R to interact with directories. So you can move a whole directory into another directory just uh, without the dash R. Okay. And okay. Yes. Okay. So now that I've run this command, 
um, we can go uh, change directories into nothing to see. Well, actually, we don't need to because we can pass a path to ls. We could, in fact, use the cd command to go into the nothing to see here directory and then ls. Um, but then we'd have to move back to the original directory if we wanted to do something. Um, and so we can simply pass a path. This is a relative path. But you can also pass any absolute path um, to ls to see the contents of any folder anywhere on the, the drive. Uh, and so here we're looking now. Um, nothing to see here previously only had a file called stuff.txt, uh, but now it has both rug177.fa and stuff.txt. OK. All right, so uh, now I've highlighted um, rug177 or 176 underscore rrna.fa. Um, and so this was, uh, I'm trying to remember the program I ran, but this is basically I ran an R, a ribosomal RNA finding program. I'm blanking on, on what it was. Um, uh, but um, in this case, you'll see that it has in the uh, size column, uh, the file is zero bytes, meaning that it's empty. Uh, meaning that uh, in the input RUG176, um, that there were uh, no, um, uh, it was not file flash. Um, uh, so RUG176, the, the FASTA file had no ribosome RNA in it. Um, and so uh, since we had no results, we don't want to keep around empty, empty files necessarily. So we're going to go ahead and delete that file. And so the delete command is rm for remove. Uh, and the, um, it uh, takes multiple parameters, but those are all, there's no source and destination here. Um, it's all just delete this. So anything that you give to rm will be deleted. Um, now, uh, the sharp-eyed among you um, might notice something here um, uh, that I, I left out. So another thing to see here is a directory. Um, so technically, I do actually need the dash r. If you want to remove a directory, you do have to include dash r, just as with um, the copy command. Uh, if you don't use, if you don't give um, rm a dash r flag when you're trying to delete a directory, it will say nothing to see here is a directory cannot delete. Um, but uh, notice that it, it uh, rm will go and delete sequentially. So this command would still delete rug177 rna.fa. Um, and then it would get to nothing to see here and say, oh wait, this is a directory. You didn't give me a dash r flag. I can't delete this. Um, so uh, even though the command would uh, look like it failed, it would actually still delete the first file. OK. All right. Um, okay, and uh, similar. No, nah, that was a okay. All right. Um, so uh, the man uh, command is the next um, uh, very useful command I want to go over. Um, it stands for manual. Uh, there is no. Uh, um, gender specificity to this. <laughs> um, but uh, this, again, is just from, um, uh, from Wikipedia. Uh, gives you the different um, sections of the manual. Um, this, these are for programs that are built into Unix. Um, uh, but uh, it also, Unix also gives you the ability to um, write manual files for any program that you come up with. And so you'll often see that um, other programs or other bioinformatics programs that aren't part of the Unix operating system uh, can still be accessed using the man command. Um, OK. And I seem to have uh, misplaced a slide here. But uh, essentially, uh, if you want to find out more about a command, let's say you want to remember what the flag for deleting a directory is for rm, then at the command line you would type man um, rm, and actually here, let me see if I can pull up, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, hopefully you can all see my command line here. So I can type man rm, 
and then it'll give, e give me the uh, user manual for the rm command. Um, and then you can use the uh, arrow keys or the enter key to scroll up and down and see the full, uh, the full manual. So these are all the different parameters um, uh, and commands. So um, by default, it will ask you if you want to delete things. Um, if you use dash F, it'll delete things without asking you. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of programs you can use. You can see the dash R there. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, there's always a short form and then a long form. Uh, sometimes there will also be alternate forms. So you can see dash lowercase r is the same as dash uppercase r. Uh, don't assume that's the case for all programs, um, but in this case it happens to be uh, dash uppercase r uh, happens to be a shortcut, or a, a not shortcut, um, an alternate command to dash lowercase r. Okay. And then you exit out of the man command using the Q key. So just hit Q on your keyboard and it will take you back. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So um, so man, so someone asked, is there any help command for all these basic Unix commands? Yes. So man is the help command for it. Um, so any any Unix command you want to learn more about, you can use the man command followed by the, uh, the name of the program we're trying to be trying to look at more. Um, or, uh, you know, just doing a web search will help. Um, explain shell is another, uh, that I mentioned before, is another good way. The, the Unix manual format is not super accessible since you have to kind of scroll up and down. And it's limited by the physical space that your uh, terminal window is. Um, and so the, the web tends to be, if you have access to the web, um, the web tends to be a better place to look up uh, the, the uh, manual information for commands. Um, but if you are on a terminal and have no access to graphical um, programs, then um, uh, man is a, a good way. The other, the other thing you can do often is um, a lot of programs will have dash, uh, dash h parameters. So you could say um, uh, xyz dash h or dash dash help, um, and a lot of programs will uh, have that as an option too instead of the manual command. Okay. All right, uh, so the next command is chmod uh, or change mode. Um, and so you'll see here at the beginning we have um, for reg212, we have dash rw dash r dash dash r dash dash. Okay. Now if you remember, the, the first one indicates it has a dash that indicates that this is a file instead of a directory. Um, and then it's broken up into groups of three. So rw dash means that the owner of the file can read and write to it. Um, it's a text file, so you don't need to be able to execute it. Um, and then uh, the other users in the same group as your user can read it, and other people outside of your group can also read it. Um, but let's say that we want um, uh, to remove, uh, we don't want anyone outside of my our user group to be able to read that file. So we can set the permissions to um, 660. Now, if we go back here, we can see that um, 6 is a combination of read and write. Um, uh, and so 660 would give the, uh, the current owner read and write permission. Um, other users in the same group as the owner also read and write permission, uh, and everyone else have no access. And so running that command, you'll see that the R disappeared, and we added a W to the um, group permissions. Um, now this is a good thing to check, uh, especially in a multi-user environment. Um, by default, um, in a lot of environments, uh, uh, the everyone uh, the everyone group will um, have but at least read access. Um, so you may want to go and check in your environment um, uh, what what those default permissions are and and change them if you need to. Um, the other the other thing that's important, and we've run into this with. Um, uh, teaching classes before where we've got um, multiple people in groups um, is that uh, by default 
Um, sometimes other people in your, your class group can't access stuff that you've created, and so you might need to go back and change permissions to let other people uh, access that. Uh, there's a question about um, uh, how do you create user groups. So that's more of a, um, a system administrator uh, option. So um, if you have administrator access, you can create user groups. Um, and so in most managed environments, um, multi-user environments like your local uh, your university computing cluster, um, you'll have to talk to the system administrators um, to create different groups. Okay. Um, and so um, uh, the uh, the numeric uh, uh, the numeric notation for file modes um, is useful for setting uh, permissions to the multiple different types of users. But if you just, for example, want to make a new program that you downloaded or wrote, if you want to make it executable, then um, the uh, symbolic notation shortcut can be more useful. You could write um, you, you know, if, if you want it, so the plus X here indicates that you want to add executable permission um, to super cool program. Uh, you could replicate that with, um, if we go back here, you could replicate that. So if you wanted to um, have read and execute permission, for example, then you could say chmod um, uh, 555 or 550. Um, but uh, plus W is a lot easier to write. And I include this also, again, being it's very practical. Um, a lot of times you'll need to do this, um, you know, if you uh, download or install a new program, um, you will often need to, especially, you know, Python or Perl programs, um, you'll need to specifically um, give them execute permissions so that you can actually run the programs. Okay, and so running the, the plus X now adds X's to, um, uh, uh, in this case, all of the groups. So if you don't want other people to be able to execute it, then you might want to use the, um, uh, the numeric notation instead. Okay, uh, grep is the next very useful program. Um, uh, it lets you search uh, the contents of uh, one or more files um, using patterns or regular expressions. So again, back to our uh, example directory here. Um, and if we look in the file rrna.fa, again, another useful, another use for cat, um, instead of concatenating these together, and it's technically concatenating these together, but since you only gave it one thing, um, it just ends up printing that out to the screen. So if you want to quickly view the content, the full contents of a file, um, you can use the cat command. Um, be careful with uh, very large files because it'll get, it'll, will print out everything. Um, so if you use cat on a multi-gigabyte file, you're going to be sitting there for a while. Okay, so we can see that the, the contents of the RNA f uh, file there, um, that FA file, um, is a single ribosomal RNA sequence in FASTA format. Um, and let's say we wanted to search um, for a, a particular um, subsequence. Um, and so uh, we type grep, uh, the pattern, in this case GCC, and then the, the file to search, which is rrna.fa. Uh, and then uh, in this case, uh, different, uh, and, and different implementations of, of Unix or Linux might do this different, but um, in mine it, it highlights uh, in red all the places where it finds a GCC. And so you can, say, you can see there's four locations. The last one um, is GCC followed by GCC. Um, now, let's say we have we have another um, uh, file called rrna3.fa, which uh, I created just by saying cat uh, rrna.fa space rrna.fa space rrna.fa, and so I literally just concatenated the same file to itself three times to create a new file. Um, but let's say I want to look for, and again, this is very useful for um, dealing with sequence data. Um, Let's say you just want all the sequence headers, um, especially in large files, uh, that can be useful. Um, and so here we're going to look, because we know that the FASTA format um, always has uh, a right angle bracket at the beginning um, of the description line. So we can search specifically for the angle bracket 
um, and we can specify with the the hat uh, character there um, on my keyboard it's above it's above the six um, uh, it's also called uh, carrot um, the carrot character is um, uh, part of a regular, regular, the regular expression language that tells grep um, that that tells grep that you only want to match characters um, that are at the beginning of a line, and so that's what we're doing here. And then we have to include the double quotes or single quotes around it because um, the angle bracket, as we know, uh, is a special character for redirecting input. Um, so if, if uh, as in the previous example. Um, where we just had GCC, that's just a string, it has no special meaning, um, and so Unix won't, will interpret it as a string. Um, but if there's any potential for um, you know, special characters, or other things that Unix might recognize, spaces, for example, if you want to search for a string with spaces, um, then uh, uh, you will need to enclose it in um, uh, uh, quotes. To indicate to Unix that it's um, that it's uh, uh, to ignore what's inside, essentially. Okay, so the question: Can we put um, grep and count together? Um, yeah, so that's that's a, a nice shortcut for um, uh, counting the number of uh, FASTA records in a multi-FASTA file. And um, uh, thank you for asking. It was already in my presentation, um, so we can, in fact. And so you can see here, again, um, the, we're going to use the pipe. And this is a good example because it shows you what the program looks like before you use the pipe. Um, and so before you use the pipe, you can see it outputs those lines. Um, and so then with the pipe, we're going to say, OK, instead of outputting those lines that grep finds to the screen, instead package them up and send them to the WC program. So WC stands for word count. Um, Depending on the parameters you give it, it counts more than words. And in fact, here what we're doing is um, giving it the dash L uh, parameter uh, flag, which tells it to, instead of counting words or characters, to count only lines. Um, and so um, uh, uh, it's telling us that, as we would expect, there are three lines in the output from the grep program. Um, now. There is, um, sorry, I thought I had an example in here. Um, uh, grep, uh, because counting lines is a uh, very common thing that people want to do, um, you don't need to be this complicated. I just, I just incorporate, I just use this example to uh, give another uh, example of the, uh, the pipe command. But grep itself has a parameter uh, dash C. Um, that specifically that does the exact same thing. It says instead of printing the dash C parameter or flag to grep, says instead of printing all of my results, uh, all, all the matched lines to the screen, just count them and tell me how many matches there were. Um, so if you, if you did um, uh, this command, if you added uh, dash C as a parameter here, instead of printing that out, you would get just three because there were three matches. Um, now, you will, it will print out the number of matches instead of specifically the number of lines. Um, so if you had, uh, in this case, we were specific enough and said only give me matches that are at the front of the line, um, uh, the, the first character of a line to be more specific, um, we're fine. But if you had just done um, angle bracket and dash C, then if there were multiple angle brackets in a line, you would get more, um, more counts than you expected. Okay. Now, um, uh, just because this is an awesome uh, comic, XKCD, if you're not familiar with it, uh, go read it. Uh, not now. Wait for me to finish. Um, but uh, <laughs> this is just uh, poking fun at some of the complexity of um, various Unix commands, tar in particular, um, which allows you to archive, uh, make an archive. Um, and again, like I mentioned, like a zip file. So. Um, uh, grouping a bunch of files and folders together into a single file that you can transport more easily around. Uh, and also makes it easier to um, compress, because you can compress the archive um, instead of compressing each of the individual files. Um, and, okay. Yep. 
So uh, going back to the very useful explain shell website, uh, we can see the anatomy of a uh, creating a tar archive. Uh, and, and by the way, tar stands for tape archive. Um, uh, I, most people I doubt are familiar with tape. That's a form of uh, uh, magnetic storage that is literally look, is literally looks like uh, tape on a reel. Um, and it's, it's still used, it's still the um, uh, almost exclusively for backups um, simply because of its uh, massive information density um, that you don't get on CDs or hard drives um, and uh, DVDs, whatever, um, and it's uh, or flash memory, and um, it is also uh, much longer lasting. It's it's much more stable, um, and so you'll see tar, you see uh, tape archives still being used um, even today uh, for backup purposes. Um, okay, so we've got a relatively complicated tar command here. So um, you'll see again we've squished the um, uh, flags together. So we have tar dash CVAF. And so if we look at the explain shell command, dash C stands for create a new archive. So we're telling it, okay, we're creating instead of, because um, uh, you can use, use tar to both uh, archive and unarchive. Um, and so here we are archiving, we're creating a new archive. Uh, dash V tells tar to go ahead and print everything that it adds into the archive that's creating. Um, dash A tells it to auto compress, and so you'll notice that the next parameter we have is foo.tar.gz, and so we'll look at that. It will expect the dot tar, and then it will look at what comes after the dot tar, and compress it using that type of compression. So gz stands for gzip. Um, there's also bz um, or bz2 compression, uh, and so we'll attempt to. Um, uh, based on how you name the file, it will attempt to automatically compress the resulting archive using that compression method. Um, so uh, then the final one is dash F, and um, dash C and dash F uh, have to go together. Um, in, in most uses, um, you'll see dash C and dash F together, and it says we're creating a file. Um, that the, the target, the, the new archive, will actually be a file itself um, uh, instead of, for example, being written to um, a tape archive. Um, okay, now uh, part of the reason that, that uh, tar is um, so hard for a lot of people to remember, um, one is the, the, the all the different flags, there are lots of different flags, um, but two, it kind of reverses the standard pattern of um, source and destination. Um, and so with tar, you have destination and then source. So you see foo.tar.gz is the file that we're gonna create, and everything after that are files that we're putting into the archive. Um, so uh, just remember that with tar, that it's kind of the reverse of what you would expect um, for the, the list of parameters. Okay. All right, so now that we've talked about um, Archives. We can and mention a little bit of compression. Um, uh, we'll talk about compressing and decompressing. So um, an archive just essentially uh, you can think of it as a, as another folder. Um, it's a single file that has a bunch of things inside of it. Uh, but by default, a tar file is not compressed. Um, whereas uh, and, this, and the reason I mention this is because other compression formats like zip, which um, uh, use Windows and Mac OS users are uh, more familiar with. Uh, in both operating systems, you can select um, multiple files and folders, uh, and then either with the context menu or the, the file system menu, um, say uh, compress or archive. And it'll give you a zip folder or a zip file. Uh, and by default, zip is a um, archiving and compression format. So by default, zip files do have some level of compression. Uh, it's not the same thing for tar. So if you want to compress your tar file, it's a separate operation, or in this case, a separate flag. <clears throat> um, and uh, I mentioned gzip because it is by far the most common form of compression um, for, uh, for Unix programs um, to the point where most bioinformatics, or a lot of bioinformatics programs, I don't want to say most, a lot of bioinformatics programs will um, uh, be able to uh, uncompress 
files on the fly. Um, so uh, a lot of times you'll see, uh, so for example, um, uh, most sequencing centers um, will give you uh, your sequence data back um, uh, compressed already. So you'll see um, uh, xyz.fa.gz, for example. Um, so you can also compress normal files, not just tar files. Um, uh, and you know, because sequencing data can be so large, um, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll end up with a lot of compressed FASTA format or FASTQ format files. Um, and so a lot of bioinformatics programs recognizing that will allow you to input compressed, you know, gzip compressed files as direct input without having to unzip them first, um, which uh, adds a little bit of time because it does take some time, especially for large files to uncompress, um, but uh, uh, definitely saves you, saves you disk space and time if you want to, as opposed to uh, uncompressing, running the program, and then recompressing. Um, so that is very helpful. Um, so gzip does have the, the best combination of speed and compression ratio. So typically you'll get, um, depending on the complexity, but I've noticed for, um, for most uh, sequence, you know, fast to fast queue, um, you'll end up with somewhere between 30 and 50% uh, compression. Uh, G unzip is the um, command to um, uncompress gzip files. Um, bzip2 is the other uh, uh, most common one you'll see. Um, it's slower, but it does get you another 20 or 30% um, compression. So if you're really focused on saving space, um, bzip2 is a better option than gzip. Um, I will also mention that gzip has multiple levels of compression uh, from one to nine. Um, so you can, when you're compressing something um, with gzip, you can get multiple levels of compression, um, one being the least compressed and nine being the most compressed. Um, so, oh, and then, yeah, again, dash J. If you're not using dash A to auto compress, um, you can either use uh, dash Z to gzip with tar or dash J to um, bzip with uh, tar. Uh, okay, and the um, resulting, or the, the companion um, uh, uncompressing program. I do also want to mention pigs and unpigs. Um, they're basically parallel versions of gzip and gnzip. So if you have a whole folder of uh, compressed FASTA files, for example, and you don't want to sit there and type gnzip 1.fa, gnzip 2.fa, you can say, um, and you, you can use, actually you can use a star with gnzip and it will gnzip everything, um, but pigs being a parallel version is somewhat faster. Um, it does eventually have to hit the, the, the drive, so um, you can only want write one thing at a time to a drive, but it has some tricks using memory um, and other sorts of things uh, to, to, it does give you a, a decent speed up um, to just doing gnzip star.fa. Um, this is not a built-in program. Um, this is something you'll have to install yourself, but, um, uh, or, or potentially uh, our um, local uh, cluster does have this pre-installed. Um, so it, it's a pretty common program that you can ask to have installed. Um, yeah, so just a question about um, levels of compression. Um, essentially, yeah, so um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the default I think is uh, three or four level of compression. Um, and it's basically just time. So the, the higher level of compression, so um, do, running gzip with a compression level of nine will save you more space or will, will get you a smaller output file than a compression level of one but it will take more time, more time to compress and more time to uncompress. Um, because I, as I mentioned at the beginning, compression is essentially throwing away redundant information. That's how you're getting smaller files because it's literally deleting information. But it maintains a way to reconstruct that information without loss. Um, um, and so, um, but in order to compress at higher levels of compression, you have to throw away more information. Um, and so uh, the resulting table that you build to figure out how to reconstruct that information uh, becomes bigger, and then you have to um, spend more time putting that information back when you're decompressing. So um, it's the same thing with, with gzip versus bzip. 
Um, VZIP gives you more compression, but it takes a longer amount of time to uncompress things. So, um, yeah, so most of the time, and I just mentioned it again for completeness, um, most of the time you won't worry about what level of compression, you'll just use GZIP by itself uh, and let it use the, the specify the default amount of compression. And for most things, that's perfectly fine. Uh, so transferring data from the internet. Um, the, the two most common commands for that are uh, curl and wget. Um, curl is useful because it's installed by default on most systems. Um, wget lets you handle more complex situations, um, for example, recursive downloads. Um, uh, a lot of times if you, um, you might try curl and it'll throw out an error for some reason. Um, especially if you're downloading stuff from websites, uh, the, the URL you're downloading from might not be an actual direct link to the file you're trying to download. It might kind of redirect things in the background. Um, and so wget kind of, can kind of uh, uh, handle that transparently for you. Um, so here's an example um, of uh, downloading uh, a, a genome assembly from the NCBI um, FTP site. Um, and the same command using curl. Um, and so curl tells it to, um, uh, the, the dash O is just saying, um, write that to a, uh, a file. Uh, if you don't use dash O, <laughs> it will uh, uh, print the downloaded information to the screen, which in most cases you don't want. Uh, okay, so um, this is another very common thing, and you'll see often, um, and again, the reason I've included this is because you'll see often that uh, sequencing centers will um, give you a file that contains um, MD5 hashes of everything that they gave you. Um, uh, so one of the sequencing centers I work with, um, they'll give us, they, they put everything on uh, an FTP site, and so I have to go, you know, um, you can go log in, copy the information back to your, your local machine or your local cluster. Um, uh, but you know, in the transfer process, um, I mean, this is you know, copying huge amounts of information over the internet. Sometimes there are errors in that transmission. Um, uh, um, the uh, internet, um, the software for transferring things over the internet, the different um, transport layers have gotten pretty good at error correcting. Um, but that, don't, that doesn't mean that you will always have um, uh, error-free transfers. And so the way to um, validate that you have what you think you have um, is to uh, verify file integrity by computing a hash value. So a hash value computes a single value for an entire file. And so basically this works is that the uh, in the example, the sequencing center um, uh, on the, the, the source machine that made the files originally will calculate this hash, um, uh, uh, this hash value for each of the FASTQ files that they're going to give you. Um, and then they will write those hash values to a file that you will then transfer along with your um, sequencing data. And then on your end, you will go and recompute those hash values. So you'll run the same program on all the files and then you can go and match each of those together. Um, the command for generating a hash file, uh, MD5, MD5 is the uh, typical, most common. Um, after that, you'll see um, uh, SHA-256 is another um, uh, hash uh, computing program. Um, and if you want to check them, uh, the quickest way is with grep. Um, so you can pass the output you can see this is the normal output from MD5 uh, from the, the hash sum calculating program. Uh, it prints it to the screen. Um, but if you, uh, you can then pass that to grep with the known. Um, so you start with uh, what the, the, the pre-computed um, hash value that the uh, sequencing center gave you. And then you can grep, that, grep for that in the output of um, the MD5 program that you're running. And if they match, then you'll you'll see the match. If they don't match, as in the second example, you'll see I changed the last character from a one to a two, then you'll get no results. 
and then you'll know something's wrong. Uh, the other option is, especially if you have dozens or hundreds of files, you're not going to go one by one. Um, the sequencing center will give you a file that contains a, the list of pre-computed hash values. Um, and then uh, in Unix, uh, in, in most, most, Linux, um, ver uh, most Linux clones, uh, Unix clones, um, the MD5 sum uh, program will have a dash C and it will expect as input a file that has all of those um, uh, pre-computed hash. Uh, uh, you can see the, the, the cat command above um, is one line for each file and it lists the hash value and then the, file, the path to the file. So you're gonna have multiple, if you have multiple directories, you'll see you know, um, the path to each of those directories and the files under them uh, as well. And if everything is good, um, it will, uh, so the MD5, if you give it a file, it will print the file name and then okay or, f or error or fail um, for each file as it goes along. So you get a big output for each of the files. Uh, if you have 20 files, and then MD5 sum will print out um, 20 lines for each, of the pro for each of the files there. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately for this uh, particular lecture, um, we won't have a break. Um, uh, someone's asking the question. Um, for some of the other lectures, there will be. Uh, but this one, there's just a lot to get through. Um, and we've only got about two, two and a half hours. So um, <laughs> uh, there unfortunately won't be a break for this, uh, for this lecture. But again, everything is recorded. Um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm available by email if you want to ask me a question later. Um, so. Uh, there, are, there are other resources uh, if, you, if you do feel like you need to take a break. Okay. Oops. All right. Um, however, we are getting close to the end, so just a warning there. Okay. Uh, text editing, um, the two most common built-in programs to Unix and Linux are Nano, and Pico, uh, Nano uh, or Pico and VI or Vim. Um, there's uh, text program, so if you type nano and then a file name, um, it will bring you into a text version of a program. Um, actually, here I can, um, so let's say we have, uh, um, um, uh, one, one, also th one thing I will also mention is that um, whereas uh, uh, Windows users are more familiar with seeing .txt or .doc or something, um, File extensions have no meaning uh, in Unix. They're useful for humans, because it tells me, okay, this is a text file, this is a FASTA file, um, but the operating system itself doesn't care um, about the extension. So, um, so let's say we want to create a new file called xyz.fa. Um, so this is the nano program. It, it, you know, um, it takes you out of the normal uh, command line display and puts you into this program. So now I can type in um, uh, right, and then so now I've created a, um, and you can use the, the arrow keys. You can't use a mouse, unfortunately, because it's a text-based program, um, but you can use the arrow keys to move around inside. Uh, when you're done, uh, it gives you the, the menu option at the bottom, so control X um, and to exit, and it'll ask you if you want to save. You can type Y. And then it'll ask you the file name to write. Um, so you can, if you made a mistake and you say, "Oh, I actually wanted FASTA um, instead of .fa," then you can change that at this point. Um, and then it'll ask you, "Do you want to save under a different name?" Yes. And then um, you can see here um, that we've created a new file. So, okay. All right. Um, okay. So. Um, the environment is also something very useful um, to, to understand something about. Um, and when I say the environment, the, um, the operating system maintains a list of essentially global variables that store various bits of useful information. Um, so uh, this is accessible with the env command. Um, and if you type env and hit enter, it'll print out a whole bunch of stuff um, so this is just a, a simple example. You'll definitely get more than that on your machine. 
Um, so this is just a simple example uh, of what, what might be printed. Um, and so individual variables, this is the most common use of echo, is um, printing the contents of an environment or other variable. So you can say echo dollar sign user, user being the um, environment, the global system variable. Um, and so then we'll print the value of, um, uh, of that variable. Okay. Um, now specifically, I included path specifically because um, of all the environment variables, it's probably the most important one to know. Um, and it's a list of directories that the operating system looks for, looks in to find programs. So anytime you type CD or LS or any of these programs that we've been talking about, um, the operating system goes to this list of directories here and looks sequentially in each one of them uh, to find that program. And so most of the, the common built-in ones are gonna be in slash bin, um, which is uh, uh, the, the last item there, and so they're colon separated, uh, list of folders. Um, uh, but if it can't find if it can't find the program you typed in e in the directories listed in path, it will tell you program not found. Um, so let's try that now. So let's say X Y Z command not found. Okay. Um, and so again, as I mentioned before, if you want to run a program that's not in the path, you need to type the um, uh, either absolute or relative path to that program. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so, for example, um, ls is located in slash user slash bin, uh, at least on this operating system. Um, and if you want to run the program that you just downloaded, you have to add a dot slash in front of it. Okay. So um, you can uh, add or modify uh, variables in your environment. Um, so if you want to add uh, a folder that's in your home directory, for example, to the path, um, you can append or prepend in this case um, dollar sign home, which is again an environment. Home is an environment variable um, that is contains the absolute path to your home directory. Um, so you can say dollar sign home slash bin, which would refer to um, if uh, uh, going back to our examples slash home slash users slash Daenerys slash bin. For example, um, and then colon, which is the separator, and then um, since you don't want to overwrite the path file, the path uh, variable completely, otherwise the only thing on path would be home slash bin, um, and then you would lose access, uh, simple access. Um, you could still, of course, use the um, the absolute paths to your programs, but uh, most people don't memorize um, where CD is located. Then you'll want to um, add the path, the existing path variable to the end of it. So what we're saying is create a variable called path and make it equal to um, the uh, contents of home slash bin and then add to the end of it the full existing path. So we've just, like I said, prepended a new path onto the existing path. Uh, this is a more complicated example of adding multiple entries. You can see they're all separated by colons. And uh, here we're creating a new uh, super secret pass key and adding it to the list of environment variables. Um, and we can use, uh, as I said, since ENV just prints out the list of environment variables, you can pass the output from ENV um, to grep. And so if you want to search for a certain environment variable, um, you can use grep in that way. Um, so. Uh, Continuing on in um, editing your environment, there's a special file called, um, if you're using bash, which most likely you will be, um, there's a file called, there may or may not be a file called bash underscore profile dot bash underscore profile. The, the dot is important. Um, but it is a, whether or not it's there, it is a file that your operating system will look for. Um, so every time you log on, um, the operating system will look for a file called dot bash underscore profile and it will execute the contents um, of that. So bash.bash .bash underscore profile is essentially a uh, script. So it will run each line being a command. It will run each of those lines um, 
before your login is complete. And so by the time you get to the prompt at your login, it will have executed all those lines that are in .bash profile. Um, so you can use it to make additions to your path. So you might have um, a set of paths that you want to always be um, added to the path folder or the path list, um, you know, your own user directories, that sort of thing, um, or any of the other environment variables you might need to do your work. Um, you can have them automatically created uh, in the bash profile. Uh, there are various other um, other things you can use. So that's just useful to know about. Uh, SSH um, allows you uh, secure access to other computers. Um, so most of the time, uh, you know, especially if you're using a cluster, you won't actually be going to the building that holds the cluster machines and sitting down at a keyboard and a monitor and typing. Um, so uh, in most cases, you will be, um, uh, as we say, SSHing into um, another computer on the cluster um, and getting access to it that way. <clears throat> so this is the uh, breakdown of the, uh, the, the um, example of the SSH command. So um, it's SSH and then uh, the username at the and then the server address. Uh, sometimes um, servers will be set up on a particular port, and you can specify that with a colon at the end of the path, the uh, server address. So, um, if you are uh, connecting to a set of, or uh, sorry, if you're connecting to a server very often, uh, for example, again, your local university cluster or some other computer, um, there's a file you can, um, uh, in your home directory, there's a directory called .ssh. If there's not, you can create it. Um, and then under that, there's a file called config. Again, if it's not there, you can create it. And the SSH program will look for it by default. Um, and so you can create shortcuts. So instead of typing SSH uh, XYZ at 192.863. whatever colon 54, um, you can store all that information in this configuration file. Um, and instead um, of typing the full username and, and uh, um, address for the server, you can associate with a short name. Um, so you can instead type SSH cluster, for example, um, or um, the, the local cluster here at the university um, has different ports for whether you are inside the university network or outside the university network. Um, and so I have, um, I have my SSH configured to have a different shortcut um, or a different shortcut name for when I'm on campus versus off campus trying to access those servers. Um, SCP is another command um, that uses SSH to copy files from one computer to another. Um, and so uh, again, back to my um, sequencing center example, uh, this is typically how um, I'll, uh, the sequencing center will send me an email saying your files are ready uh, and they're in a, a consistent location. And so I can go um, use the SCP command to copy securely over the network from their server to my local machine. Um, and uh, uh, where SSH only has the, the one, the um, sort of destination, the server destination, um, SCP is just like regular copy, the CP command, it has a source and a destination. Um, and so in this case, I'm using, uh, uh, and, and the source can be your local machine, so you can copy from you to a, a remote computer, or you can copy from a remote computer to your machine. Uh, and this example is showing I'm copying uh, the file file.txt um, from the server, server host.tld uh, with the user, user, um, and I'm copying it to um, a file, a folder on my local machine. Um, and again, as I said, we can upload, so I can specify a file on my local machine and specify the destination as a remote machine. And then it will copy file.txt to the remote machine. Um, so I see a question about SCP for shared Google Drive links. Um, technically, yes, but it is very difficult. <laughs> um, I actually just ran into this uh, about a month ago, um, and 
I think I got it to eventually work, but it was definitely not as easy as saying, oh, let me go copy the link to this file on Google Drive and then just paste that into my terminal. Um, there was definitely some some uh, complexity to it, so um, that that can be and, and it's it's fairly similar with um, now you can create uh, Google Drive. Um, uh, you can I'm trying to think. Um, I think Dropbox is probably the best because it does give you a direct link. Some of the other ones, I think um, Box and OneDrive might give it to you. You can, in other words, where you can create links um, to a file. Um, uh, but probably what you're going to want to do, actually, instead of SCP, what you're probably going to want to do is just use wget um, uh, to, to grab from uh, any of these cloud providers. OK. Um, all right. And uh, because SCP doesn't care um, where things are, as long as you give it a valid uh, user and path, um, you can, in fact, uh, copy from one remote server to a second remote server, <laughs> uh, which isn't very common, but I mention it because it is technically possible. OK. Um, and just uh, sort of an example tying all this stuff together, everything that we've talked about so far. Um, we're going to create a folder called bin temp, a temporary bin directory. Uh, we're going to change directories into it. And I'm going to use wget to download the usearch program, which is um, a uh, clustering similarity search program that's often used, um, especially in um, uh, 16s you know, amplicon sequencing. Um, so I'm going to download that from the website. And then, uh, as you'll see, it's uh, gzip compressed. So I'm going to uh, ungzip it to um, reveal the program. Um, so the usearch 11.0.667 underscore i86 linux32 is the actual program. So when I unzip it, there's just the program left. It's not an archive. Um, and then I'm going to move the uh, uncompressed uh, program into a folder, or sorry, I'm going to um, use the MV command to rename it because um, uh, I don't want to type usearch 11.0.667 every time I want to run usearch. Um, so I'm going to rename it to just usearch. And then because it's a program I've downloaded from the internet, it's not automatically um, executable. So I have to chmod plus x um, to make the program executable. OK. Um, we're getting close. Let's see. Yeah, OK. All right, so we are at about two hours. Um, we do technically have uh, an hour left. Um, so uh, let's, um, I said there wasn't going to be a break, but let's take a quick break for questions. Um, if there are any questions people have, um, before I get to the rest of this, because the um, every and, and again we're we've only probably got another ten maybe fifteen minutes left, um, but uh, uh, the rest of this is more abstract kind of stuff. Um, it's not really related to all the Unix commands we've been talking about. So um, if anyone has a burning question uh, about the Unix commands we've been discussing so far uh, that I haven't already answered, um, we can take a few minutes uh, to have people type those. Um, and uh, um, and then I can I can answer them before we uh, finish up with everything. And I have a secondary monitor over here, so I'm not just kind of looking into space. Okay, so um, the question is how uh, how do you use? Uh, I'm assuming how do you connect um, to a remote server from a Windows PC? That's a good question. Um, the there are let's see the um, there is an SSH uh, program, but um, last time I used it, it was not free. Um, so if you want a free uh, a free program for um, using SSH or connecting to a terminal over SSH, um, your best bet is Putty. So let me bring up the web browser here. Um, So um, here I will uh, 
put this into the chat um, so that everyone can see it. Um, so uh, let me zoom things in here. Um, yeah, so PuTTY is a Windows program um, uh, that allows you to SSH. So it's, that's its only purpose is SSH, um, but it gives you a terminal um, that looks like this, um, more or less. Um, but it asks you where you want to connect first, and then once you connect, it just gives you um, a, a command line, just like this. Um, okay. Okay, so we have a question about um, uh, VI and VIM. Okay, ah, all right. Um, okay, well, I will, uh, since the, the only thing I put into the chat was um, the link to PuTTY, I will go ahead and put, I should have put that, uh, instead of answering live, I should have put that in the, I uh, should have answered it um, via text as well. So I will put that um, up there. Um, we can also just Google search for uh, PuTTY, maybe PuTTY SSH, um, and it'll get you there. Um, so I have a question about um, VI and VIM. Um, so uh, VI is um, just a, uh, a text editor, just like um, Nano and Pico are. Um, it's a little more complicated. Um, it's uh, mainly because if you want to do things um, it has a set of commands that uh, are not as visible as with nano so again if I say nano um, XYZ dot text or dot FA um, automatically in nano I can just start typing um, and uh, and entering text into it right so um, Okay, and then I can save it. I can type Control O to write out, and then Control X to exit. But it gives you all that information there. Um, VI, you have to know a little bit extra um, to start doing things. So I can type VI or Vim uh, in some operating systems, um, and uh, in, in most operating systems, I think now they're both they're basically um, uh, aliases for each other. But I can type VI X Y Z. Uh, oh, one thing I forgot, it's not technically Unix, but in most current operating systems, um, you can type, type tab to autocomplete, which is what I just did there, so X and then tab. Um, so uh, by default, VI or Vim starts out in uh, command mode, not text editing mode. So if I want to start editing, then I have to type the I character first. And now you see the screen change to insert mode. And so now I can say, okay, this is so sequence ID, and it changes to sequence one, two, three. Um, but then I have to, if I want to save the file, for example, I have to go from insert mode back to command mode. So I have to type escape. And you can see insert went away. And now that I'm in command mode, um, I have to use the uh, uh, VI command colon uh, W would write, um, and I can also, if I want to write and then keep going, um, I could do that. So let's say I want to write it out. So it says it was written. Now I want to make another uh, addition. So I have to go back into command, into insert mode by typing I, and then I'll go down and add a few more. Okay, and then I want to hit escape. So I'm in command mode, colon W, and this time I just want to quit. So I type write, W for write and Q for quit. Um, and, then, and then I'm done. Um, 
uh, I typically recommend Nano over VI for most new people because it's uh, Nano is more intuitive um, than VI. Um, but uh, I do mention VI because it is. Um, uh, if Nano isn't available on a system, VI almost certainly will be. Okay. All right, um, we'll give it another couple minutes. Um, if anyone has any information or any questions. So, okay, so we did have a question from a while ago about um, workflow languages like SnakeMake. Um, uh, so, those basically, um, uh, SnakeMake is um, uh, a like like the questioner asked is a workflow language so it essentially allows you to uh, set up um, uh, set up a way to execute multiple commands in sequence so um, it's pretty common in bioinformatics to have um, a snake make workflow for doing very common things um, so let's say I want to uh, prepare my sequence data and so like I said before you want to do um, uh, uh, filter and trim my FASTQ files, and then um, uh, if I'm working with microbial data from, for example, a human source, I might want to run um, Bowtie 2 against the human genome to remove any um, human contamination from my uh, microbial DNA, um, and then I might want to run Prodigal to um, look for coding sequences, and then I might want to um, use diamond to map my uh, coding sequences against a database of proteins, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so what snake make lets you do is it lets you specify a set of commands and a set of input and output files. Um, and then it lets you uh, order, um, put those commands in order. Um, and it even has some options for uh, error handling. So if um, it, you know, you can check uh, at each step, you can check that the output file from the previous step was created properly. And if it wasn't, it gives you some options for uh, trying to fix things um, or just outputting useful error messages. Um, but uh, yeah, so for, um, for very standard, so if you're running the same pipeline, um, you know, with the same programs and the same parameters, every time you get a set of sequence data back, for example, um, then something like SnakeMake uh, can be very useful, uh, and even some uh, even some programs, um, uh, some standalone programs, kind of use SnakeMake internally. I've seen um, to run various bits and pieces of their own. Uh, if 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 there's a um, the program is running sort of a complex internal set of commands, then I've seen programs use SnakeMake internally to sort of order those together. Um, so uh, it, it can be very useful. It does take some time and effort to learn the workflow language and to set things up. Um, uh, but once you've got that set up and everything, it, uh, uh, it can be very useful uh, to, to use. But the, all that detail is a little bit out of the, uh, um, you know, I could spend an hour on that separately. Um, so it's a little bit out of the, uh, the context of this, um, this webinar. Okay, all right. Um, well, either all of you have understood 100% of everything that I've said, um, or uh, you're still marinating and thinking about things. Um, that's fine. As I said, the, uh, uh, the webinar recording will be made available later. And um, uh, as always, you know, uh, I'm available by email um, and uh, 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 web various web searches should be able to get you most of what you need for for a lot of this the um, uh, there there are any number of, of very good resources um, covering all the the unix basics that I'm talking about as well um, so all right uh, okay well let's go ahead and um, uh, keep going so uh, for package management um, uh, containers and virtual machines so, um, uh, I, so far I've been talking about um, uh, mostly built-in programs. 
Uh, but when we start getting to the um, running programs that aren't built into Unix, uh, and so in this case, you know, I'm talking about, as I just mentioned, a bunch of different um, bioinformatics programs, um, uh, you know, Trimomatic, uh, Bowtie 2, Diamond, Prodigal. Um, these are all programs that you're going to have to uh, go to the internet, most likely, download onto your computer, and um, install somehow, potentially, depending on what you do. Um, and so this, uh, um, this uh, image I got from this uh, article on torddatascience.com, um, and it kind of gives this uh, pyramid of um, uh, interaction with the machine. So the, the bottom of the pyramid is bare metal. Um, this is sort of the uh, binary commands that the processor would see, um, or that your OS, uh, your operating system, interacts with. Um, on top of that um, are virtual machines. Uh, you might see here this um, icon for virtual box, which is uh, one of the more common um, uh, programs for running virtual machines. A virtual machine is literally an entire operating system in a box, essentially, that you can um, run. So there's an operating system within an operating system. Um, uh, and so you, what you'll do is you'll download an image for an operating system. So this is another way that um, Windows users um, can get access to things if, uh, if the, the um, Windows Linux subsystem isn't working. Um, or they just want access to the full Unix uh, or Linux operating system. Um, you can install VirtualBox uh, and you can create a new virtual machine and you can download um, a, uh, a disk image of the operating system installer. Um, so for example Ubuntu and, and VirtualBox is nice because it, um, it lets you set up some, some operating systems automatically. Um, but uh, uh, you can basically create a virtual machine and what that does is it creates a, um, a file on your computer that contains all the information, all the data for that operating machine, uh, for the operating system. Um, and so you'll go, you'll install the operating system to that, um, you know, using VirtualBox, it will install the operating system to that little file on your computer. Um, and it will, uh, VirtualBox itself will act as a separate computer. Um, and so the the virtual machine will run as a separate computer inside your operating system. Um, and so you can switch back and forth. Um, the problem is it tends to be slow. Um, you have to have a lot of disk space because you're literally installing an entire operating system. Um, but if you have no other options, then it's a good way to get access to uh, uh, other operating systems, especially Linux. Um, so Docker containers, uh, and this, this was focused on Docker, but um, uh, what's more common in scientific computing is uh, Singularity. Um, they have uh, since been uh, bought out by a company that has renamed them to Aptainer, which in my opinion is a ridiculous name, um, and I refuse to use it, so Singularity. Uh, but Docker and Singularity containers are uh, sort of one step uh, up. Uh, I don't know what the best direction to describe that is. Um, but yeah, at least on the pyramid is one step up, um, but it's less complex than a virtual machine. So um, a Docker and Singularity containers contain um, part of an operating system, just enough to run um, programs inside of them, but um, not so much that you're completely replicating the operating system. Now the useful thing is with, with those is that they do, since they are at least partially self-contained, um, you don't have to install anything to run them. Uh, well, that's not entirely true. Docker, you do have to install either Docker or Singularity. But once you've installed those, you don't need to worry about compiling things or um, you know, having uh, other libraries, other programs avail available, for example. Um, and someone cr can create a Docker or Singularity container that has all the necessary um, dependencies and programs and everything um, and then uh, and it just exists as a file in your computer um, but then you can access and run programs within that container 
um, and and share those containers around. And in fact, as we'll see, there are whole you know website repositories containing Docker and Singularity containers, um, and so they're very they're very good for uh, reproducibility. Um, and so uh, you're you're starting to see now sometimes that um, for uh, uh, journal articles, people will um, uh, sometimes create a, a Docker container replicating their environment. So all the programs and everything they use to run the analyses. Um, and so you just need to download the container um, and then you can sort of, uh, and, the, and then their, their sequence data or whatever it was, uh, and then you can replicate all the analyses they ran on their paper with um, minimal, minimal effort. Um, uh, and so one step uh, above that then is uh, from containers is Conda environments. So we've now gone from containers to package management. Um, so uh, Anaconda, uh, you can see the uh, icon over there, um, is a way of managing software. So you run it on your operating system and you can use it to install programs within, a, in, within an environment. Basically what an environment is, it's kind of like the container that, uh, idea that I was describing, um, but it's, um, uh, it's only partially separate uh, from your operating system. So it's, it's a bunch of programs and files that you install to a specific folder on your computer. Um, and what Anaconda does is that um, when you activate that environment, Anaconda will go and change your path and other environment variables so that um, when you run programs, uh, when you run a program, let's say I, I create a, uh, a Conda environment for my bioinformatics tools and I install um, Diamond and Prodigal to it, I can activate that environment and a Conda will change my path, my system path and perhaps some other environment variables. And so then when I run, when I type Diamond at the command line, um, because the path has been changed, it will go look for Diamond first in the Anaconda folder, environment folder, instead of somewhere else in the operating system. Um, uh, and the nice thing about Anaconda is that it maintains, um, uh, basically people will create uh, install instructions um, uh, for, uh, for a program. So let's say, again, going back to my Diamond example, so Diamond might you know, depend on five or six other pieces of software. And so Anaconda will say, okay, I'm gonna go out and look for these pieces of software, and I know where they are already because I already have packages for them. I'll install them first, and then I'll go to my um, install instructions for Diamond and install that. And it takes care of a lot of stuff for you. Um, the nice thing about Conda environments is that um, uh, anyone can install them. You know, even if you have, uh, even if you're on a managed system, and you only have you don't have right access to the system. You can ins still install. Uh, I would recommend Miniconda, which is a smaller version of Anaconda. Um, you can install that to your home directory and still create Conda environments within your within your uh, home directory or other directories that you have access to, um, and and still install programs in a much much easier way than downloading compiling them yourself. Um, the problem is that uh, there are still issues with dependencies and. Um, and other problems, you know, especially if you have um, a lot of software installed in a single environment, you can run into issues. Um, and since you're again still, Anaconda is basically just doing things for you, but it still has to download and compile um, programs. And that can still be an issue depending on what um, libraries your system has installed. Um, so you can still run into problems installing um, software with Anaconda. Um, but uh, you are still installing on your computer. Um, the, the issue with Docker and Singularity is that to create, uh, and this is an absolute, there are some ways around this, but generally to create Docker and Singularity containers, you pretty much need to have system administrator access. So um, that's the main reason I would generally, uh, I, you know, you might want to go with Conda over um, creating your own Docker Singularity containers is simply whether or not you have whether or not you're able to create those containers. Um, uh, but in terms of reproducibility, containers are much better than Conda environments. The best you can do with Conda environments is give someone um, essentially a, a software list 
Um, you can have Conda export the uh, sort of environment contents, um, and then someone else can go and use that um, to reinstall. You'll see that with uh, Chime, for example. Um, uh, Chime has a, um, uh, a YML file that contains instructions on how to set up a Conda environment um, to, to install all the stuff necessary for Chime. Um, <clears throat> okay, I see a question about virtual machines. So, um, no, so virtual machines, I was talking about, and you can run virtual machines on a cloud server or something, but um, when I was talking about VirtualBox, for example, um, so vir VirtualBox is free software, um, you can, and, but I was talking about downloading and installing VirtualBox on your local computer. So on your laptop or your desktop machine or whatever. Um, and then installing something like Linux, which is also, again, free. You can download the operating system free and then install it um, on your local computer. Um, now, you know, again, again, virtual machines are very popular um, on cloud systems, for example. Um, and, and large corporations will use virtual machines in various ways in the cloud, um, in addition to Docker containers and that sort of thing. Um, but, but when I was talking about virtual machines, I meant just on your local machine. Okay. All right. Um, and then, of course, at the very top, uh, you can download and install any programs that you want manually. Um, some require more or less effort to get to install, um, especially uh, things like Python or Perl. As long as you have the Python or Perl programming language installed, or the interpreter for those installed, then you can just download a Python or Perl script and just run them. Um, that gets more complicated depending on how many uh, library dependencies that script may have. Um, but other, uh, other programs, like if we go back to the usearch example that I gave before, um, uh, that's just compiled a C program that's compiled specifically for Linux. And so you can download a pre-compiled fi uh, pre executable file and just immediately run it. Um, so you don't need, need necessarily to do all this complexity. Um, some programs you can just very easily download for your specific operating system and run without too much difficulty. Okay. Um, so I just want to give you an example um, of Singularity. So uh, um, one of the very useful things about Singularity and Docker, but I'll focus on Singularity, uh, like I said, just because it was more... Um, Singularity is Docker, but with tweaks that are specifically meant to help people run programs on... Um, uh, high performance computing systems, so clusters and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, this is an example of, of Conda that kind of describes what I already described. Uh, and yeah, again, just a, a visual representation of what I was describing for um, Docker, um, where the software is uh, already compiled and installed within the container. Um, and you're sort of issuing commands from outside the container to be run inside the container. Um, and so here they have an example of uh, a container with um, BWA, um, SAM tools, and Freebase, and processing um, various inputs and outputs, implementing a workflow with all, all with containers. Um, so again, that is a nice thing is you have your with the containers, you have your fastq file, for example. You start out with your fastq file, and you give it as input to the container, to the BWA program in the container. The container will take the file as input, run BWA within the container environment, and then output back into your local directory a SAM file. And then that SAM file will be used as um, input to SAM tools. Do whatever you want with it. Uh, in this case, we're converting it to a BAM file, a uh, binary version of the SAM file. Um, and then the, um, the SAM tools container will output the resulting BAM file. And then you can use that invariant calling with um, the Freebase program. And then at the end, it will output the, that VCF file. OK, so um, uh, this is one thing I want to highlight. So the BioContainers website, biocontainers.pro. Um, uh, and this is basically a, 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 a registry, so it's, it's just a, um, a list. It maintains a list of container software, both Singularity and Docker. 
um, uh, containers specifically in the area of bioinformatics. Um, and so uh, let me go to their website here real quick. So um, this is their website. Um, I uh, have never been able to get their website to consistently work. So you can go to the registry and search. And let's say I want to search for uh, diamond. So I type diamond and hit search. And it sort of does this for a while. Sometimes, OK, wow, that actually worked. So that's good. OK, so um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I, my font is, OK, there we go. This might be a little small, but I'm going to click on the diamond link. Um, see if I can make it a little bit bigger again. Um, and so, uh, and you'll notice the, the URL is biocontainers.pro slash tools slash diamond. Um, and I will put that in the, the chat so you can go there directly. Um, and it will, again, this is just a repository, so they don't actually maintain any of these. They use other, or sorry, this is a, um, a registry. They don't actually, they have, they may use um, other repositories that we'll get to. Um, so, um, yeah, this is uh, Diamond, the Diamond tool page. So it'll give you instructions on how to install with Conda. Um, with Docker and with Singularity. Um, now, again, uh, I like Singularity. It, it works better with um, HPC systems. Um, and so um, here, they uh, this is um, one of the key uh, websites that actually maintains these <coughs> software um, containers, the physical files. So key.io um, and uh, the Galaxy Project also is another source for um, actually going and getting these. I typically go to key.io simply because it has a nice interface. Um, so this is key.io, and they have a search box. So let's search for diamond. Um, and then uh, there, the nice thing, but well, potentially nice thing, you can see people will build lots of containers with diamond in it, uh, perhaps different uh, versions or containing different things with it. Um, and um, OK, and so this is the, the main page for Diamond. And then if you click on the tags, it'll give you all the different versions that are available. And so this is, again, very nice reproducibility. If some program says they use Diamond version 0 0.8.31, then you can go and say, oh, yeah, there's that version, and go and download a container that has that exact version of Diamond. Um, so you can try to reproduce their results. Um, now, uh, the nice thing, so, uh, and before I do that, so um, the Galaxy Project website also has a list of Singularity containers. Um, it's just a file list, so it's not super useful. So I can just use my browser's find command and search for Diamond. Um, and it does have some variants. Um, and so these are sort of the official ones. Um, uh, and the, these are just um, hash values indicating different um, non-official or non-full release versions. Um, but uh, uh, I, like I said, I typically use key.io just as a little bit of a better interface. Um, the nice thing too about Singularity is that it can convert Docker containers. So if there's a container, a Docker container containing the software that you want, but you want to use Singularity, Singularity will automatically convert it for you. Um, and so let's go ahead um, and let's say we want to download one of these. Um, then I was on a system using Singularity. Um, and so we'll use the pull command. Um, and then since uh, these are uh, key.io maintains only Docker containers, we have to tell Singularity we're pulling from a Docker repository. Um, and then uh, let's see. Key.io slash, uh, maybe remembering this incorrectly, but essentially, yeah, the idea is um, the software name and then colon and then the version. So if I did want to download this uh, older version, I would just copy that string and the tags, um, paste it, and then hit enter. Ah, I clearly, here, let's see. I had this. 
Sorry, going through all my previous commands. Um, here we go. Okay. Ah, right. Okay. I missed um, a. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, I needed. I just missed something here. So bio containers. Okay. So, um, and then you'll get this, um, uh, this output. And so now if I type ls and see what's in my f uh, set of files, um, I have now a diamond uh, sif, which is the singularity um, container. Uh, and so now I have that version of diamond that I can run. Um, so I've already, I'd already previously done this with um, prodigal. So I have a prodigal uh, container on my system. And uh, so if I want to run it, uh, if I want to run the software inside of it, um, there are a couple ways, um, but uh, all the software, all the containers you download from um, key.io or the bio containers um, will work in, in the same way. So you write singularity, run. Um, another option is exec, but the, again, that depends on how the, um, the container is set up. But for the most part, singularity, run, and then um, prodigal. Uh, and sometimes the, the container will be set up so that um, running the, uh, especially for a container that's just a single piece of software, sometimes um, just running the, the, um, uh, the container will run that program automatically. And so for example, if you were gonna um, uh, run prodigal you in that setup you would just start by typing parameters um, but in this case all the ones all the uh, containers downloaded from um, bio containers um, uh, running the uh, running the uh, container just gets you into the container you actually need to specify the program itself but um, essentially everything before here is sort of um, you can ignore and just run the program. So if you already have a, a command line example for prodigal, for example, um, you can literally just ignore this part. You still have to put it on the command line, of course, um, but you would run the program just like you would without all that stuff as if you had the program installed directly on your computer. So prodigal-i, and I'm going to, um, so prodigal again is a, a coding sequence that finds genes or potential genes um, in DNA. Uh, and so I'm going to use as input um, this uh, assembled genome for Yersinia pestis. Um, and I'm going to output to genes. It's going to create a new folder called genes. Um, so I'm going to run the prodigal gene finder algorithm on this genome and output the results to the genes folder. So I'll run it. Um, and so you'll see here, um, you'll sometimes get these warnings. We can mostly ignore these. Um, that's just from Singularity. But then after that, it looks exactly like as if you, again, had Prodigal installed on your system. Um, and so since it's just a single genome, um, uh, it went through, found all the genes real quick, and now I have a folder called genes. Um, oops. Uh, Anyway, uh, that, so something's happening. Um, ah. Yeah, so um, I forgot that uh, probably was output a single file. Um, I was thinking of, of Praka. Uh, anyway, so um, those are all the genes it found. Um, so those are containers. Um, and again, uh, this is super useful for uh, reproducibility. Or um, you know, if you don't want to spend time, or if you're having problems installing a piece of software, but um, bio containers um, has uh, I have yet to find a um, uh, even some of the the smaller programs that not a lot of people use um, is I, I found it here um, or on key.io. Um, so pretty much any bioinformatics software, there are some issues with software that um, like we'll see later with. Um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on it now. Um, uh, the uh, genome, uh, yeah, let's see. Yes, um, 
So the second to last lecture, yeah, GTDB. Um, so some programs that require large databases can be difficult to get running with containers, um, but those tend to be the exception. Um, otherwise, uh, containers are, are a great way to go um, for software reproducibility. Okay. All right, so, um, yeah, so and again here I just have uh, an example of uh, everything I did. I just put those in there in case the live version wasn't working. Um, and, uh, okay, yeah. All right. Okay, so just to, to finish up, just a little bit about programming. Um, you know, there will always be situations, uh, uh, bioinformatics um, is, is often called uh, 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 leaky, <laughs> bioinformatics pipelines are called leaky often because um, you know, you'll have one program output something, but it's not quite what you need as input to a different program, so you have to m manipulate the output data to get it into a particular format or something else that you can use then as input to a different program. Um, uh, so uh, FastSpar, for example, which is um, uh, uh, creates uh, correlation networks. Um, it outputs uh, a file of correlations and a file of p-values separately. Um, but if you want to create a network from those, um, any network software will need, um, uh, well, and you might, you might want just a single file that contains correlations and p-values. Um, and so you might have to write some code to, to go through and match the correlations with the p-values into a single file. Um, you, know, you might need to, uh, as I mentioned before, cycle through a list of files, applying some command to each. Uh, a bash for loop will get you that. Um, uh, R uh, is the um, uh, primary place for bioinformatics um, statistics, which we'll get into next week. And so you'll need to learn a little bit of R um, if you're doing uh, running statistical approaches on your data. Um, uh, and uh, uh, just in general, Excel is evil. Don't use it. Um, it automatically changes gene names. Uh, to dates, <laughs> uh, and that kind of stuff has made its way into GenBank. Um, so if you want to clean your data, if you want it, if you must use a, a graphical program, use um, LibreOffice um, for their uh, spreadsheet tool, or just use R or Python. Um, so uh, these are R and Python are the primary languages people use for bioinformatics. Um, Julia has sort of been up and coming for a while, but it's not quite as widespread yet. Uh, okay, high performance computing, and I'll just finish up with this. Um, so, uh, high performance computing is essentially, um, and I keep referring to the word cluster, uh, it's basically just a bunch of computers all in one location that can talk to each other, um, usually with high speed uh, interconnects. Um, and so, the uh, Ohio Supercomputing Center, for example, is. Um, uh, is an example of a cluster. Uh, this is from their website. Um, and you can see the, the cluster here, each computer, or sometimes called a node, is represented as one of these cubes here. And so each of these cubes are connected to each other over high speed, uh, this 100 gigabit per second InfiniBand network connections. And so all the computers here um, uh, are connected to each other with very fast connections. Um, and they're also connected to uh, these storage volumes. Um, and then these are the different characteristics. They have different nodes, have different amounts of RAM and different numbers of processors, and some of them have GPUs and that sort of thing. But all this computing power is all together and all accessible um, from, uh, from one place, essentially, which makes it very useful. So you can um, run a command on a single computer, a single node, or you can run a command on 100 nodes uh, if you need to do that. Um, so this is just an actual picture. Each of these storage cabinets contains one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least 10 um, computers uh, just that slide into the slots there so they can all share power and cooling and network and all that kind of stuff. So that's just physically what they look like, which is why I said before, you're not going to physically go there and sit at a computer or sit at a keyboard and mouse or a monitor. Um, you're going to SSH into one of these. Um, Exceed is um, a national resource um, connecting multiple, um, last time I checked it was uh, 16 or so um, 
computing clusters. So you can see here on the right, um, various places, Indiana University, University of Kentucky, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center contributes a lot, um, University of San Diego, um, various government uh, facilities as well. So you can see it kind of ties all these together. Um, and especially if you don't have access to a server computing center or a cluster on your campus, um, then Exceed is a very good resource for getting access to these. The Pittsburgh supercomputer, for example, um, will take applications for use. You have to write a little, small little proposal for how you're going to use, uh, what resources you're going to use and how much and that kind of thing. But um, as long as you're at a U.S. institution, um, you can get access to that those computing clusters. Um, outside of the U.S., I know the uh, EMBL, various other um, uh, European-based um, computing centers can do similar things, although I don't have um, particular uh, experience with those. So if, if someone does, if they want to put that into the chat. Um, uh, yeah, so, okay, so, um, Renee, um, uh, yeah, so they are free. Uh, so the, the Pittsburgh Supercomputers, um, Bridges, for example, um, it is essentially free. Um, the only thing you need to do is, again, write a, a like a little mini grant explaining how many resources you need and for how long and what you're going to do it with. Um, and the, those uh, proposals are, are all peer reviewed. And if they um, uh, if they decide to, to grant you that time and, and computing resources, then you'll get that for free. Uh, the only back the only limitation I said. Um, as I said, is that you do have to be at a, a US-based um, institution. Uh, okay, uh, and the other question is, how are threads and CPUs different? Um, so uh, a single CPU, um, uh, so a CPU is a physical piece of silicon, um, and a single CPU can have multiple cores, and each of those cores can have, can run one or two threads. So um, if we go back to the example of the um, uh, supercomputing center, so you can see here, um, uh, yeah, so the, the large memory nodes here running, um, so each of these 12 large memory nodes have two uh, Intel Xeon Platinum processors. So there are two physical processors on each of these nodes. And each of these nodes have, um, uh, uh, sorry, each of those nodes, each of those processors have 24, uh, can run 24 threads or 24 cores. Um, uh, and so all in total, um, each of those nodes have access to 48 cores or, or in terms of threads, you can run a program with 48 threads on it. Okay. Um, i say a little bit about distributed versus parallel computing. Um, distributed computing, uh, if we go back to those that uh, list of uh, cubes, um, so you would run one job on each of those nodes, and each job would be more or less separate. Um, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, they'd be separate, they have separate memory and processors, but they can communicate with each other through message passing. So it's one way. Um, uh, one one form of large-scale computing. So if you want to run, for example, if you have some huge file, um, you would, uh, uh, with distributed computing, you would, for example, um, have a, an interface and that, that interface would split up your large input file into smaller input files and pass it to each of the nodes, the computing nodes, they would work on those separately and return their answers to the master controlling node um, that would then integrate the results back together. Like I said, it's, it's difficult to implement, can be very complex, um, and isn't often used in bioinformatic applications. Um, parallel computing, all the processors have access to shared memory. So for example, um, in the, the two processor node that I just mentioned, the computer itself has two separate processors, but since they're on the same physical machine, they have connect, they're they're both connected to the same set of, of memory, um, and so uh, any file splitting up in coordination is um, internal as opposed to over a network interface. Um, and so this is also referred to as multi-threading um, that you'll see. Um, GPUs are another form of um, uh, parallel computing. Um, 
uh, people realize that, hey, we've got these hundreds or thousands of GPU cores that are really good at doing simple math. Um, uh, and whereas a CPU might have, you know, 48, 128 cores, GPUs will have hundreds or thousands. And so that's the reason GPUs have become extremely popular in um, deep learning, machine learning, um, because they need to do lots, thousands and millions of, of these simple calculations. Um, by simple, I mean, you know, multiplications and, and squares and that sort of thing. Um, and it can offload that to the GPU, leaving the CPU to do other things. Um, and so you'll see uh, often in clusters, you'll see GPU nodes. They're uh, computing nodes that have access to one or more GPUs um, that, that can often be used for deep learning. Um, I haven't seen uh, as much use in uh, bioinformatics, but you can find some. <clears throat> okay. All right. So. Um, we have uh, that we're at the end of uh, the presentation. Um, so we do still have about 15 minutes um, uh, on our time. Uh, the, the original plan for these is to have these lectures be about you know, an hour and a half to two hours with some time additional for questions. Um, so I've kind of done the, the questions in between and we took a little bit of a break. Um, so. Uh, but feel free to leave if you have to go. Um, as I said, uh, I'm available by email uh, for questions, um, but I will stay on for a little bit to see if anyone else has any additional questions uh, before we close out. And uh, uh, if you have to leave, I will see you again next week for our discussion of um, the basics of ecological statistics. And the following week, um, uh, you will be uh, uh, seeing Ahmed Zaid, who will be uh, going over more advanced ecological statistics. Uh, so again, if you have to leave, thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you for the rest of the webinars. OK. so. Um, yeah, someone's asking about Anaconda for package management. Um, sometimes it can be slow. Um, uh, again, Docker can be a good replacement, but um, uh, again, you have to be able to create those Docker containers. And um, in a lot of cases, you need root access or uh, administrative access. Um, so if you have that, that's fine. Um, and it is a little bit more complex because you have to create a Docker file that explains to the Docker program, how to install what you're going to install. Uh, but once you have that set up, um, then yeah, Docker can be great. And especially if you can create your own containers, um, then you can set up multiple complex pieces of software. So I just showed um, downloading containers that have one single piece of software. Um, but uh, you can create your own custom containers that have multiple pieces of interacting software. Um, and so that can definitely be uh, a better way to go than with Anaconda. Um, there's more setup up front, but once you get that set up and you've got your container, then you're pretty much good to go. Um, so yeah, so definitely containers um, uh, containers can be a very good alternative to uh, Anaconda and Anaconda environments. Um, all right, so I have a question about uh, accessing the recording. So um, the uh, website for, uh, um, well, first of all, uh, I believe um, we'll send an email when recordings are available, um, but you can also go to the, um, uh, yeah, the comms website, um, the Center of Microbiome Science website, um, and go to, here, I'll just paste this into the, um, so uh, the recordings, when they're available, will show up on the uh, website. Um, and I'll paste the link to that there. Um, and we'll probably also send out, at some point, um, uh, a link to that through the, the uh, email list that everyone signed up for, um, or the, the registration list. Um, so everyone will, everyone will have access to that. Um, okay. And then, 
Uh, how do you know if a node runs one or two threads? Um, you just have to look at the, uh, the system of specifications. Um, uh, and basically, if uh, they should at least, uh, for any node, they should at least list the kind of processor. If they don't list the number of um, cores the processor have has, you can always do um, a web search to look that up. Um, there are commands uh, in Unix to figure out how many um, how many computing cores are available. Uh, I don't have that command memorized, but um, you can certainly do a, a web search for um, how to figure out the number of uh, cores available to your system um, in Unix. Oh, and uh, one of the early questions we had um, was uh, going back to um, my little configuration script here. Um, yeah, so <laughs> this this uh, is entirely done with a program called Archie, uh, A R C H E Y. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's. Uh, I tried. I got a new laptop recently, um, and uh, I think the original Archie has gone away. Um, but there are different, there are replacements for it. But um, yeah, if you just do a web search for Archie, um, that's what I use to create this uh, uh, command line information um, uh, headline thing there. Okay, and as well, uh, I, di I did mention um, there are additional resources for uh, Unix. So these are some of the ones um, so I, I already mentioned Explain Shell, but um, these are some additional websites that have some that I, I've personally used that have have really good information. But there's there's um, any number of these available online. Okay. All right. Well, 